Hometown Billionaire, a Christian Small Town Romance. Sweet Home Billionaires, Book Two. Written by Hannah Jo Abbott. Narrated by Candace Peppers. Chapter One Pete Collins had vowed he wouldn't return to Pine Haven, Alabama. And yet, here he was. His private jet taxied into the hangar, and a car waited for him. His assistant had seen to the details, and Pete had told her he didn't need a driver. He could navigate the town he had grown up in on his own. He settled into the driver's seat of the red sports car and left the airport in his rearview mirror, where he wished he could leave the town. Pete sighed as he left the busy interstate in the city and drove on to the country roads leading to the small town. He did notice the scenery as he drove. The leaves were starting to turn from green to red and yellow. He had to admit that it was prettier here than in New York City. He had made exactly three visits back in the last five years, but he only stayed for a couple of hours before jumping back on the airplane. This time would be different. His mind traveled to the day before, when his phone rang and he saw that his mom was calling. He had been in a business meeting, so he let it go. But when she called again only a minute later, he knew something was wrong. Mom? His voice sounded anxious. Pete, his mother answered, her own voice calm, but said, It's your grandmother. She passed away this morning. Pete's heart thudded in his chest. How? was the only word he could find. It was just her time. She seemed fine when I saw her yesterday, but she was ninety-two. It seems she just went to sleep last night and didn't wake up this morning. Pete sighed and leaned back in his chair. I'm sorry, Mom. I'm sorry, too. Pete could hear his mom's voice quiver. I'll leave first thing in the morning, Pete said. All right, we'll see you then. We're still making plans, so we'll talk more later. He remembered his grandmother as a firm woman, but she had a sweet spot for her grandchildren. Pete had always been the one to get caught doing something he wasn't supposed to, picking apples out of the tree before they were ready to be picked, or sneaking into his grandfather's pickup truck to play, and his grandmother would be dragging him into the kitchen by his ear. But five minutes later, Pete would have her laughing and convince her to bake a chocolate pie. Now in the car, Pete smiled, thinking about the life lessons she had taught him. His guilt grew as he remembered how little he had seen her in the last few years. Every Christmas, he offered to fly the entire family to New York. His grandmother had only come once. She said she liked being home for the holidays. Pete sighed. How would the family get along without his grandmother? And how would the town? His grandparents had both been pillars in the community. Pete wiped his forehead, remembering that was one of the reasons he had always wanted to get out. He loved his family, but he didn't want to live in the shadow of Jenny and Peter Collins, his namesake. That wasn't the only reason he hadn't come back. A face drifted to his mind and he shook his head to try to get rid of it. But she wasn't easy to forget, especially with the red curls that framed her face. He shook his head again. He wouldn't think about that now. He could only hope, by some miracle, that he wouldn't run into her while he was in town. He had enough on his mind with his grandmother's funeral and his business without thinking about the girl he left behind. After passing through Main Street downtown and winding through country roads, he turned into his parents' driveway. The house sat off the road, and Pete pulled through the circular driveway and parked in front of the house. The two-story brick house was older, but well-kept. 
His parents had done plenty to update the inside, but the outside still looked the same as Peter remembered it from his childhood. He took the front steps two at a time, but stopped at the top before reaching for the door. He turned around and glanced off to the left. His grandparents' home stood a few yards away. Pete sighed, thinking about never seeing them again. Never walking from this front door to theirs. Of course, he hadn't done that in years, but the thought that it was no longer an option filled him with sadness. He turned back and opened the front door. The clicks of his dress shoes sounded heavy against the hardwood floor. He made his way through the foyer, and he heard voices in the kitchen. Rounding the corner, he saw his mom and dad sitting at the kitchen table with his sister. Peter. His mom was the first to see him, and she stood. Pete met her in the middle of the kitchen floor and wrapped her in a hug. I'm so glad you're home, she said as she pulled back to look at him. Home. Could that still be true? Me too, Mom. He went to his father next, who stood beside the table. He reached out and grasped his hand, and then his father pulled him into a man hug and patted him on the back. Hey, Pete. His sister Jennifer came and hugged him too. We've missed you. I've missed you too, sis. They all took their seats again around the table, except for his mom. Are you hungry? Can I get you anything? Susan Collins was a southern lady through and through, and taking care of people was in her blood. I'm fine, Mom. Let's just sit. That seemed difficult for Susan to do, but she sat down anyway. Do we have plans today? Susan sighed. Yes, there's still so much to do. I have to go by the funeral home and make final decisions. I can go with you, Pete offered. Susan breathed a sigh that sounded a little like relief. Oh, thank you. That would be helpful. Pete nodded slowly. He didn't know how to comfort his mom, but his skills lie in doing business and making tough decisions. He might not have the words to say, and he knew he hadn't been there like he should, but this he could do. Chapter 2 Mallory Edwards straightened up her desk and tightened her long red ponytail one more time. She glanced over her classroom that had held 25 first graders all day and checked to make sure everything was in place. Noting that it was, she pulled her bag over her shoulder and headed for the door. She opened the door and was reaching to turn out the light when a voice stopped her. Hey, Mallory, all done? Her friend Lacey called out. Yep, just walking out. Hang on, let me grab my bag and I'll walk out with you. Lacey disappeared into her classroom across the hall. Mallory reached up and switched off the light and then pulled the door shut behind her as she waited for Lacey. Busy day? Lacey asked as she reappeared and shut her own door. Same as usual, I guess, Mallory shrugged. Lacey fell into step behind her. So why the long face? Mallory stopped and turned to her friend. They had known each other since high school and had gotten close since they started working together at the elementary school. She couldn't hide anything. Jenny Collins passed away. Lacey sighed. I heard that too. I'm sorry. I know the whole town will feel that loss, but I'm really going to miss her. When did you see her last? Mallory shrugged. It's been a few weeks. I've just been busy and haven't made the time. Lacey looped her arm through Mallory's. It's all right. You spent a lot of time with her over the last few years. I'm sure she knew how much you cared. Yeah, I hope so. The two began walking again and made it outside where they headed towards the staff parking lot. Suddenly Lacey stopped again and her hand flew to her mouth. 
Do you think he'll come back for the funeral? Mallory steeled her gaze and answered in a flat voice. I'm sure he will. It's his grandmother. Lacey scoffed. Yeah, but for the man without a heart, does that matter? Mallory let her head fall into her hand. I don't want to think about it. Will you go to the funeral? I would be too afraid to see him there. Mallory looked back up and met Lacey's eyes. I will go to the funeral. She was an important lady to me, and I won't let him keep me from going. Besides, she straightened her shoulders and stood a little taller. I'm not afraid. I'm not the one who promised I would come back and then disappeared without a word. You're right. I'm sorry. They shouldn't have to miss on account of him. I still talk to his parents and sister, too, you know. Yes, I know. And I'm proud of you for the way you've handled it. Much better than I would have. Lacey paused to laugh. But that's because you're a much better person than I am. Mallory laughed and gave her friend a quick hug. I don't believe that at all. But thank you for the compliment. Now I'm starving. Want to get a milkshake? Absolutely I do. Come on, I'll drive. The two women climbed into Mallory's car and took off to their favorite after-work spot. The Shake Shack was known for their milkshakes and their burgers and fries. Mallory sighed, and on a day like today, she just might have all three to drown her emotions. She had told Lacey that she wasn't afraid, but the truth was she was nervous to see him tomorrow, shaking in her brown flats nervous. They passed by the shops of Main Street, and Mallory let a small sigh escape her lips. Lacey was chatting about her third-grade class escapades, and she was trying to listen, but it was hard to convince her thoughts to focus. Pete Collins had done a number on her heart five years ago, and there was no way to prepare herself to walk into the same room as him. But she determined not to let him see her upset. He had had his chance, but now she had built a life of her own here in the town that she loved. And she loved Jenny Collins like her own grandmother. Mallory had almost been a part of the family once, and she wouldn't let Pete keep her from paying her respects. He had taken enough away from her on his journey to New York, and she wouldn't let him take any more. Chapter 3 Pete stood by his mother's side as they greeted guests at the funeral home. He glanced around the room that was completely filled with floral arrangements. He knew his grandmother had been loved in their small town, but this was even more than he expected. He tugged on his tie and smoothed his hands down the jacket of his dark black suit. His sandy blonde hair was gelled to perfection with not a hair out of place. His mother said his name and brought his attention back to the couple in front of him. He smiled and nodded as he said, Thank you for coming, even though he didn't know the people. His mother said they had known him when he was little, but it didn't matter much to him. He leaned over and whispered to his mom, I need a drink. Can I get you anything? I'm all right, she whispered back. Pete planned to bring her a bottle of water anyway. She stood beside her mother's casket for over an hour now as the line of guests grew to fill the room. As Pete made his way towards the back, he could see that it now stretched out the door and down the sidewalk outside. He took a turn to the right and into the family room to grab a bottle of water. He took a long swig of water and tried to clear his head. Why did everyone in this town care about everyone else in this town? He had stayed away for so long that he had forgotten what southern hospitality and small-town life was like. He shook his head, refusing to get sucked back into this town, this life. It was nice, true, and quaint, but it wasn't for him. 
No, he told himself, not for me. The longer he stood in the room, the more suffocated he felt. He finished off the water and tossed the bottle. He needed some air. He made his way out of the front door of the funeral home. A few people said hello, and he raised his hand and nodded as a way of greeting, but he didn't stop. He just needed a little break. So he kept walking, but there were people everywhere. He heard someone call his name and turned his head over his shoulder to say hello. When he turned back, he found himself walking into a small cluster of people standing in the grass. He looked up and came to a complete halt. Mallory. She hadn't noticed him yet, but there she was. Her red hair fell around her shoulders, setting off the black, long-sleeved dress that fell just above her knees. He stood without moving and without saying anything. The world moved in slow motion as she turned her head and made eye contact with him. He saw a flash of something in her eyes. He didn't know what to call it. Determination, maybe? Or fight? Maybe even a little anger? Whatever it was, it wasn't sadness. But when Pete laid eyes on her, he felt it in every part of his being. His skin prickled all over, and his heart flip-flopped in his chest. Even his breathing changed in that moment. He told himself to just breathe in and out. He also told his eyes to look away from her, but they wouldn't listen. When he found that his voice could work again, he said, Hi. Hi, Mallory said, and gave a small smile. I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. He finally pulled his eyes away from her and glanced at the circle of people around them. Hello, he said. He recognized a few faces from his high school days, but the rest of the people were strangers. This is Pete Collins, Jenny's grandson, Mallory explained for the group. He's here from out of town. Pete couldn't have known how each word from her mouth would feel like a knife. He looked around the circle and gave a sad smile as they offered their condolences. Jenny was a wonderful woman. She will be greatly missed. Mallory looked at Pete as she spoke, and it seemed as if she wanted to add, Not like you. Yeah, I think so. He looked at her again, and wanted to ask how she was, how she had been for the last five years, but her look told him not to bother. I better get back inside now. Pete turned to go, but as he took two steps away, Mallory spoke again. Goodbye, Pete. He glanced back over his shoulder at her, understanding her meaning. He lifted his hand in a small wave. I guess I deserve that he thought. As he walked away, he thought he should feel hurt in some way. Instead, he only felt guilt and surprise. Guilt over leaving without saying goodbye to her, and surprise that he had forgotten just how beautiful she was. Mallory pasted on a half-smile as the circle around her continued conversation. Her heart pounded, and she hoped no one could hear it. Did her face show how shaken she was? She had known she would see him, but had thought it might only be from a distance. When she looked up and saw him standing in front of her, she wanted to turn and run. Had he been looking for her? No. His eyes told her he was surprised, maybe even a little afraid. Still, his presence hit her almost physically, in only a few seconds, she felt the wave of emotions pass over her. She expected the sadness and the anger and the desire to run. What she hadn't expected was the way her heart flip-flopped, like she was just a little glad to see him. She also hadn't expected to notice how good he looked. 
but who doesn't look good in a thousand-dollar suit? She couldn't quite put her finger on how it all made her feel. But it doesn't matter, she thought, as she turned her attention to the conversation. He'll be gone again soon. That's his superpower. I just need to focus on my own power of not thinking about him. I wonder how I get that power. Chapter 4 How long are you staying in town? Hudson Jennings, Pete's best friend, asked. Maybe a week or so? Pete answered. The two friends sat outside the country club, where friends and family had gathered after the funeral. The number of guests had been too large to fit in Pete's parents' house. I offered to help settle my grandmother's affairs. You know, she owned a few properties in town. I don't think Mom's ready to give up her house yet. But we can let the other properties go. You don't want to keep them as investment properties? Pete scoffed. Why would I want investment properties in Pinehaven? Hudson shrugged. Might be nice to have something here in town. I don't want anything here in town. That's why I left. I know, you've mentioned that a time or two. Pete reached over and playfully punched his friend in the arm. Just because you decided to settle down here, away from the lights of New York, doesn't mean everyone wants to. Right, Hudson mumbled. But Pete, what is it that you want? Pete stared off and didn't answer. I mean, we're a lot alike, you and me. You have a great company that you built from the ground up, so you have enough money to buy whatever you want. You can travel anywhere, you can even start a new business, and you can live anywhere you want. But you don't want to be here where you grew up and where your family is. So what is it that you want? To do my own thing, to be my own person. I never wanted to be tied down in this town, and I didn't want to be just a member of the Collins family, he said, making air quotes. So you wanted to make a name for yourself, and you've done that. You started one of the most successful social media apps, and now you've got a growing business of more apps than I can keep track of. Pete smiled. That's because the number changes every few days. In fact, that's one reason I need to get back to New York soon. I need to close the deal with a major dating app. Can you get a profile on this dating app? Me? Pete's shock showed on his face. Yeah, you. I'm trying to tell you that you have everything you think you want, but you are living life alone. Is that making you happy? Pete shrugged. I don't know. Mallory's face popped into his mind, and he tried to push it away. Maybe I'll figure that out one day. I wouldn't keep putting it off. You're no spring chicken. Speak for yourself, old man. Besides, just because you found a happily ever after here in Nowhereville doesn't mean that's what will make me happy. Hudson held his hands up. I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying you should think about some things besides business. My dad waited until the end to realize that family was important. I don't want that for you. Thanks, man. I appreciate you looking out for me. He patted Hudson on the shoulder. I also would appreciate soundly beating you on the golf course while I'm in town. What do you say we play around tomorrow? Can't, Hudson said. We have a retreat this weekend, and I'll be busy at camp from tonight through Sunday night. Hudson and his wife, Shannon, started a camp for kids and teens after Hudson moved to Pine Haven to get away from his family business and the demands of the billionaire lifestyle. Man, I was hoping we could hang out. Why don't you come out to camp this weekend? It's a high school retreat weekend, and you could even speak to the campers about your business experience and reaching your goals. Pete reached up to rub the back of his neck. I don't know about that. Come on, it'll be great. 
You can inspire them for a little bit, and then we can still hang out while I work. It's the only way I'll have time while you're here. Pete looked at his friend with a doubtful expression. I have to help my parents with my grandmother's estate during the day. But maybe I can come Friday evening. Perfect. Hudson clapped his hands together. Then he stood. I need to get back now. Shannon left already to finish up final preparation, and I'm sure she'll have work for me to do when I get there. He reached his hand out to Pete. So I'll see you Friday. Pete reached out and shook Hudson's hand. Friday. Pete turned his rental car onto the dirt road leading to the main part of the camp. He had spent two days with his parents, going over every document and piece of property. They went to his grandmother's lawyer's office to read the will. She left everything to Pete's mom and her two sisters, which everyone expected. Pete spoke with his parents and gave them his best business advice about the properties, but he left the final decision up to them. Now he was tired and wishing he could just jump on a plane back to New York and sleep in his own bed. But he had made a promise to Hudson, and he wouldn't break that promise. Pete drove past the horse barns and the path to the cabins and parked in the gravel lot near the chapel and meeting building. When he stepped out, the cool of the evening surprised him. The autumn temperatures were falling, and here in the shadow of the woods, it seemed cooler. Pete noticed it also seemed quieter and... What was that other thing he felt? Could it be peace? He knew he hadn't felt that in a long time, so long that he didn't even recognize if that's what it was. He kept himself too busy to think about emotions or feelings like peace. Pete shook his head as he shut the door of the car and walked towards the building. Just before he reached the two steps up to the porch, the door opened and Hudson appeared. Hey, man, glad you made it. Pete took the steps in one bound. What? Were you watching for me? Yep, saw you coming through the window. To be honest, I wasn't sure you would show up. Of course I would. I said I would. I know, Hudson said. I'm just joking, man. I trusted you to come. I just know you would rather be plenty of other places. Pete shrugged. I'm here and I'm happy to help out. Great, let's head inside and I'll introduce you to our staff. Hudson opened the door and Pete followed him inside. The force of the sound in the room hit Pete in the face. He glanced around at the teenagers talking around the room. They looked like typical high school students grouped off by cliques. The athletes, the nerds, girls in a separate group than guys, and a few guys who had ventured over to talk to the girls. Pete let his eyes wander to the rows of chairs, probably 75 or 100 of them, all facing the slightly raised stage. He noticed a guitar off to the side of the stage, and a screen on the back wall was showing pictures from around camp with Bible verses imposed in front of them. Pete, this is our speaker for the weekend, Gavin Hodges. Pete turned his attention to the man Hudson pointed to and reached out to shake his hand. Pete Collins, he said. It's nice to meet you, Pete. I knew your grandmother. I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. I think she knew everyone in town. Gavin chuckled. Yes, I think she did. She was a treasure in this town, and she will be missed. I think so, too. So I hear I'm going to share the stage with you tonight. Pete smiled. Sure, if that's all right with you. Of course, I'm glad to hear your story. I think it will be encouraging to some of these teens. I guess so, Pete shrugged. Girls, we're going to start soon, so be ready to take a seat and listen. Pete froze at the sound of the female voice that called out. The rest of the room went silent in comparison, and he slowly turned, hoping that he was just imagining things. The sight of a long red ponytail told him he wasn't. Pete, Hudson said, come on, I'll introduce you to some of the counselors. Mallory, 
Pete asked, a look of panic coming over his face. Yeah, do you know her? Pete gave him a deadpan stare. Hudson, it's Mallory. He said the words slowly and deliberately. Yeah, so. She's, um, she's, you know, the girl. Pete dropped his voice low and looked at the floor. He held his hands up over his eyes as if that might hide him from her. Mallory is the girl. Hudson's voice was full of shock, and when Pete looked up at him, Hudson's eyes were wide. Yeah. Why did you never tell me that? Because I didn't think it mattered. I knew you might cross paths at some point, so I didn't want to give you a reason to be awkward. But I didn't know you would hire her to work at your camp. Pete spoke the last sentence, though, through clenched teeth. Hudson ran his fingers through his hair. Well, to be fair, I didn't hire her to work here. She's a volunteer for the retreat. She's been a counselor a few times, though, so I know her pretty well. She's never once mentioned you. That stung. Pete knew she had to know that Pete and Hudson were friends. Was she protecting herself from saying anything to Hudson? Or was it possible she was protecting Pete? Pete shook his head and turned again to Mallory's direction. Just as he did, she turned and glanced his way. He saw the shock register on her face, followed by anger or sadness. He wasn't sure which. And finally, that same determined look he had seen at his grandmother's funeral. Then she turned around and walked toward the front of the room without a word. Sorry, man. Hudson spoke quietly. I would have said something if I had known. It's all right. Pete didn't meet his eyes. It's my fault, you know. It'll be all right. He knew he was trying to convince himself more than Hudson. I'm going up front. We're about to get started. We'll sing a few songs, and then I'll introduce you. And after you, we'll be Gavin. All right, Pete said absent-mindedly. He was too distracted to hear what Hudson was saying. He watched his friend approach the stage and call for everyone's attention. All right, everyone, it's time to get started. Please find a seat and turn your attention to the front. Counselor Mark is going to come up and lead a few songs, but first let me pray. Pete watched around the room as the counselors bowed their heads. Most of the teenagers did too, but some kept their heads up. Pete could tell which ones were signaling that they didn't want to be here. He knew that feeling. Dear Father, thank you for tonight, Hudson prayed. Thank you for everyone in this room. I know that you love each person standing here, and I pray that you would use the music and the words spoken tonight to reach each heart for your purpose. Amen. Pete looked up as another guy, probably in his mid-twenties, approached the stage and picked up the guitar. He began to play and sing, and the words in the worship songs appeared on the screen behind him. Pete didn't know the songs, and he wasn't really a singer. He stuck his hands in his pockets and watched from the back of the room as the music played. Mark, the worship leader, played four songs before offering another prayer and stepping down from the stage. Hudson patted his shoulder as he passed him and turned to face the crowd. Thanks, Mark. Y'all can take a seat. He motioned to the students and waited for them to get settled. We have a special treat tonight, in addition to our fantastic speaker, Gavin, that we will hear from in a few minutes. I've asked a special guest to come and talk to us tonight. Pete Collins has joined us all the way from New York. He grew up in Pine Haven, just like you, but he has made his way in the business world. You may have heard of a few apps like Global Chat and Business Book. Yeah, he created those. I know you already know his name, and I hope you will give your full attention to an incredible businessman and my best friend, Pete Collins. Pete rubbed the back of his neck and dropped his gaze to the floor as he approached the front. 
He could feel the eyes of everyone in the room, but he felt certain he could feel the angry stare of one person alone. He took long strides through the middle of the rows of chairs and took the two steps to the stage in one bound. He took a deep breath and told himself to just focus on his words. His pounding heart and the sweat beating on his brow had other ideas, but he was a professional and he could do this, couldn't he? Hey guys, I'm glad to be with you tonight. Thanks, Hudson, for having me here in my old stomping grounds. He glanced around and took in the faces around the room. He knew when Hudson told them about his business, their ears had perked up. He knew what it was like to be a kid in a small, dead-end town wanting to get out. And he knew they would listen to him tonight. So Hudson's right. I grew up here in Pinehaven just like you. I went to Pinehaven High School and I watched football games in the same stadium every Friday night. But I always knew that I wanted to be my own boss and build my own business. He cleared his throat and began to feel himself finding his way into the speech. He had made this one many times and he could do it again now. I wasn't really that special or different. My parents and grandparents were from here, so it was pretty expected that I would graduate from high school, go to college, and then come back here and settle down. But I wanted more. So at a young age, I started making goals and plans. I wrote down those goals in high school, and I kept them in front of me all the time. My first piece of advice for all of you is this. Make a goal whatever it is. Maybe you want to be like me and live in New York and run a multi-billion dollar company. Or maybe you want to be like Hudson and run a camp out in the woods. Maybe you want to be a garbage man. The crowd laughed. Whatever that goal is, write it down. Start thinking about that goal every day and keep that paper somewhere you can see it. On your wall, on your bathroom mirror, on a picture on your phone, whatever. Just start thinking about what that goal is. Then you have to start thinking about what it's going to take to reach that goal. Do you need to go to college? Do you need to learn computer coding so you can create an app? Do you need to be a good writer? Researching and learning what you need to do is the first step. Pete held his hands up in the air. Now I know plenty of you are thinking... I'll never go to college or take a class to learn about computers. I can't afford that. But let me tell you, if you make a goal and you start working towards it now, you can make a way. There are scholarships to college for first-generation college students, or you can work in a job and start saving money to get you the training you need. If you commit to it, you can find a way. Pete paused and looked around the room at the group. They were hungry for answers he could tell. He wanted to tell them all he would pay for their school. He would help them out. But he had learned fast. He couldn't offer to help every kid he met along the way. My last piece of advice is this. Never give up. When I made my first app, I was in college. I tried to get funding for it. No one was interested. Turns out it was a terrible idea. No one cared about it. I could have given up. I could have let that defeat me, but I didn't. I came up with a new idea and another new idea and another new idea until I had the perfect idea. Then investors were fighting over me. If I had given up, I never would have found the right idea and I wouldn't be where I am now. Pete took a deep breath and held his arms out. I don't have all the answers and I really just know about the particular business that I work in but I have put in the work and I haven't given up. The two of these, coupled with a clear goal of where I wanted to be, have given me success. I will be here tonight and tomorrow and I'm happy to talk with any of you if you want to talk about goals with me. He raised one hand in the air. Thanks for letting me be here. With that, he stepped down from the stage as the students clapped politely. Hudson came back up. Thanks, Pete. I didn't tell him what to say or what our topic was about this weekend. But it's funny how God works these things out. He smiled as he paused.
Now I'm going to bring up Gavin. He will be sharing with us a couple of times over the weekend, and he's going to be talking about how God defines success. Pete's own ears perked up when he heard Hudson say that. He took a seat near the back and let all the anxiousness sink into the chair with him. He avoided looking Mallory's direction and instead kept his eyes and attention focused on the speaker in front of him. He determined that he would listen on the slim chance that there was something he could learn. Chapter 5 Mallory paced the back hallway of the chapel. She knew she had to go back in soon, but for now her campers were hanging out before time to head back to their cabins. She stopped to type furiously on her phone. I can't believe it, but Pete is here. Hudson invited him to speak, and now he's just standing there surrounded by campers, practically worshiping him, and he's smiling. It wasn't long before she got a reply from Lacey. What? Are you serious? Yep. Wow. Is he staying for the weekend? No. Well, I don't know. I hope not. I thought you were fine with him. I am. But I didn't expect him to be here at camp. This is supposed to be a safe place. Ugh. I'm sorry. Just smile and ignore him. The night is almost over. Mallory sighed as she typed one more text. You're right. Then I'm sure he will go back to New York and disappear again. She hoped that was true. Anger coursed through her body. How dare he show up now, and at her camp? The place where she had found purpose and thought that maybe she was still in this town for a reason. She ran her fingers through the length of her hair a few times and took a deep breath to calm herself. I can do this, she whispered. She hoped that was true, too. Pete laid in bed in the camp guest house and stared at the ceiling. Sleep evaded him despite the fact that he was exhausted. After his talk, many of the teens came up to speak to him and ask questions. He smiled and answered each one in turn, but he snuck glances around the room at Mallory. She chatted with high school girls. He couldn't help but notice how they adored her. But why wouldn't they? She was beautiful and kind and fun. He let his gaze fall over the long-sleeved T-shirt and jeans that showed off her figure. He could remember the feel of her in his arms, and the thought took his breath away. Now he lay in bed thinking about her. What was her life like now? Did she hate him? He sighed and rolled from one side to the other for the millionth time, telling himself that it didn't matter anyway. Hudson had asked him to stay the night and be here in the morning. He welcomed the break from his parents' house. He loved his family, but he knew that the longer he stayed there, the more they would draw him back into the town. And then they would try to convince him to stay. That was the last thing he wanted, wasn't it? Pete startled when he heard the front door of the house open. He knew he had locked it. Could someone be breaking in? He jumped out of bed and looked around for something to protect himself with. He heard a knock on the bedroom door and relaxed. He didn't think intruders knocked. Pete, Hudson's voice called out. Pete pulled on a shirt as he reached for the door. Hey, is something wrong? Actually, yeah, I have a camp problem. Pete ran his hands through his hair and squeezed his eyes shut before opening them again. What kind of problem? What can I do? Hudson grinned. Pete felt like it was an ominous sort of grin. What was Hudson up to? I'm glad you asked, Hudson said. One of our male counselors had a family emergency and had to leave right away. Oh, no, is he all right? It's his grandmother who lives a few hours away, so it was urgent that he go. Of course, I'm sorry. But what does that have to do with me? I have a cabin full of teenage boys who need a counselor. 
Now, I can stay in the cabin at night to fill in if I need to, but... He looked at Pete and raised his eyebrows. But what? Pete tilted his head at his friend. I need someone to help with the group during the day. Pete reached out and gently pushed Hudson until he stepped backward out of the room. Then he shut the door in his face and went to sit on the bed. Hudson opened the door and walked through, laughing. I know, I know. It's not what you expected for your visit to camp. But it's not like babysitting. They're teenagers. They don't need hand-holding. They just need somebody they can talk to if they need it. And I need a leader for their games and activities during the day. Games? Activities? Pete stared at him in disbelief. Yeah, you don't have to plan anything. It's all laid out. You just have to be there and be a part of the group while they compete against the other cabins. I don't know about this. Come on, man. I saw you last night with them. You listened to their questions and answered them with patience and kindness. And I've seen you get riled up at a football game. You can do this. Football? I don't think this is the same thing. Maybe not. But the excitement is there. Pete looked doubtful. Come on, man. It's the middle of the night. And I need someone to be there to start at breakfast tomorrow morning. I literally have no other options. Gee, thanks. That makes me feel so special. Hudson grinned. You are special. I wouldn't ask just anybody to do this. Besides, maybe it was part of the bigger plan all along. Maybe God wanted you to be here tonight so you would be here to help in your best friend's time of need. Pete eyed Hudson for a moment. He narrowed his eyebrows and then slowly reached over and picked up the pillow and pounded Hudson with it. Fine, but you owe me big time. Hudson threw the pillow back at him. Sure thing. Now get some sleep. First thing tomorrow morning, report for duty, Counselor Pete. Pete groaned and rolled over on the pillow as Hudson shut the door. What in the world had he gotten himself into? Chapter 6 Mallory stepped lightly as she walked from her cabin door. Her campers had all gone out just before her, so she pulled the cabin door shut and went towards the path to the main part of the camp. She took a deep breath and breathed in the cool morning air. She loved it here. Her heart leapt at the thought of the weekend with her campers. She knew it would be a full day and she would collapse in bed that night exhausted. But at least she wouldn't have to deal with Pete today. Her steps were quick, and her smile spread wide as she came out of the woods and the sun shone on her face. The dining hall was across the field, and the giggles of the high school girls in front of her led the way. When she entered the door, her focus went straight to her cabin's table, she was two steps away when she heard a familiar voice, Pete. What was he still doing here? She took a seat with her back to him and took a quick glance over her shoulder. He stood at the next table with Hudson at his side. Maybe he's just staying for breakfast, she thought. I can ignore him that long. Guys, you remember Pete from last night, Hudson was saying. Mallory's ears perked up and she took in every word of the conversation. Since Nathan had to leave in the middle of the night, Pete is going to be filling in for him. Mallory couldn't help the look of panic that came over her face. Luckily, her campers were engrossed in their own conversations and too busy to notice her. Hey, Jess, who was Nathan's cabin paired up with for games? Hudson asked. Mallory felt the heat in her cheeks as she turned just in time to watch their faces when Jess answered. Mallory? Hudson's eyes flew open, and Pete immediately looked her way. Mallory wanted to melt into a hole in the ground, but instead she lifted her chin and put on a stoic expression. Oh, Hudson said. Um, Pete, we pair each of the guy cabins with a girl cabin for our competitions. He paused and cleared his throat. 
<laughs> it looks like you'll be paired with Mallory for the weekend. Hudson turned to his friend and gave a strained smile. Mallory knew by that look that the two of them had talked about her. Great. Now everyone knows I'm the girl he didn't care enough to send a forwarding address to. She stood and forced her own smile. Hi, Pete. That's nice of you to fill in on short notice. Nah, not really. Hudson didn't give me much choice. Well, I'm sure he appreciates it. She met his eyes, and a familiar feeling washed over her. She knew those eyes. She had gazed into them most of her high school career. Once upon a time, she had thought she had seen the future in those eyes. Now she saw a complete stranger. She didn't know Pete Collins now. Maybe she had never really known him. See you on the field, she said, and turned her back to him. Her campers had tuned into the conversation, and as Mallory turned back, she saw some of the girls whispering and giggling together. She ignored it, even though she had a pretty good idea of what high school girls might be saying about Pete Collins. The girls passed around the plates of biscuits, sausage, eggs, and fruit. Mallory put a few things on her plate, but her stomach was in knots and she was too afraid to eat much. She managed a few bites and turned her attention to her campers. After breakfast, all the campers headed out to the field for their first activity of the day. The teens stood in groups by their teams, and Mallory put herself right in the middle of a group of girls. She saw Pete walk onto the field surrounded by the group of guys. They seemed to idolize him already. Mallory resisted the urge to roll her eyes. Hudson walked to the middle of the field and raised his voice to speak to the group. All right, everybody, attention, please. Now you're all paired up in your teams, right? Yeah, the teams around the field called out. So I guess you're ready for your first competition. Yeah. All right. The first competition is capture the flag. Each team can pick two team leaders to go and place your flag in a tree in these woods or those woods. Hudson pointed as he spoke. Don't go more than 100 paces into the woods, but you can hide it on the ground or up a tree or wherever you can find. We will wait for each of the captains to come back and let us know their flag is hidden. Then we will blow this horn to start. Whichever team can capture another team's flag and return to their home base first will win. Hudson glanced around. Everyone got it? Yeah. Go ahead and pick out your team leaders now and then send them to me. When we have representatives from each team, I'll send them out. Mallory listened as the girls and guys started talking all at once. We should send Chris, one of the girls said. Yeah, Chris can climb up a tree faster than anybody else. No, they'll be expecting us to put it up high. Send Chris, but let Sarah go and hide it in the bushes while Chris climbs. Yes, perfect, another girl said. Around the circle, everyone nodded or called out their agreement. So, is that your decision? Mallory asked. Chris and Sarah? Everyone agreed. All right, then. Chris and Sarah, go on out there. Mallory noticed that Pete hung back from their circle. The teens talked excitedly as they waited for all the team captains to return to the field. The guys were busy talking strategy and where they thought the other teams would hide their flags. It wasn't long before the leaders had returned and checked in with Hudson. Chris and Sarah returned to the group and all the teens huddled around while they whispered about where they had placed the flag. All of a sudden, a loud blast sounded from the horn, and the teens dispersed, cheering loudly. Mallory found herself without her buffer of campers, standing only a few feet away from Pete. She stuck her hands in her back pockets and rubbed the toe of her tennis shoe in the grass. The sound of slow footsteps crunching leaves behind her told her Pete was coming closer. So how long have you been a counselor here? She didn't look in his direction when she answered. 
I've worked most of the weekend retreat since they started. I guess you like it then. Yep. It was silent for a minute before Pete spoke again. What are you doing now? She finally had to turn and look at him. He looked as good as he always had, but she knew he was different than the high school boy she had known. His dark jeans looked like they were made by an expensive designer, and his long-sleeved button-up shirt wasn't exactly meant for a weekend of playing capture the flag. The boots must be borrowed from Hudson. They were dirty and worn, and they weren't the tan dress shoes he had worn the night before. Mallory sighed as she looked him in the face. I'm a school teacher, elementary school. He lifted the corners of his mouth into a grin. That's what you always wanted to do. Mallory looked away and stared at the line of trees. Yes, it is. She pretended to be watching for the campers coming out of the woods. I would ask what you're doing, but I think everybody knows that. So you mean you've kept up with me? No, no, I don't mean that. But you know how small this town is. People talk. Yes, I'm sure they do. He fell silent again, and they stood and listened to the sound of teenagers calling out through the woods. Mallory? Pete turned to her as he spoke. I'm sorry. I didn't know you would be here this weekend. Really? Mallory's voice held a challenge. You had no idea. No, not at all. Hudson didn't tell you? Pete looked at the ground. Hudson didn't know who you were. Oh. Mallory wasn't sure whether she should be grateful or hurt. He knew that there was. He paused, as if searching for the word. He knew about you, just not that it was you. I never told him your name. I didn't want him to meet you and feel awkward. I just thought that would be better. Better for who? You? No, for you and Hudson. She sighed again. I did wonder why he never brought it up. I've known him for a while now. Listen, Mallory, I'm... No. She held up her hand to him. Don't, Pete. She met his eyes for only a second. Just don't. All right, he said quietly. But just then the silence was interrupted by yelling as a group of teenagers emerged from the woods. One boy was running with a flag and yelling as other boys were chasing after him, trying to grab the flag. It looked like the first boy was going to get away, but another boy started gaining on him. Mallory watched as the second boy reached out for the flag, but then both boys' feet got tangled up and they went tumbling over each other. In their confusion, they both lost the flag. A girl from a different team ran over and grabbed the flag and went running in the other direction. She was gone before anyone noticed and headed to her team spot to secure the victory. Pete laughed out loud. His deep voice rumbled and his shoulders shook with his laughter. Mallory glanced over to watch him, and the sound of his laugh sent tingles up her spine. He had been a practical joker in high school, and so many of her memories included that laugh. She shook her head to keep herself from running down memory lane. She had closed that door long ago. She pulled her eyes away from him and started walking towards the gathering of teens in the middle of the field. She could feel Pete's eyes on her, but she kept walking. She would make it through this weekend somehow but Pete could just get used to watching her walk away from him. He had already taken his turn at that. Chapter 7 The afternoon sun was getting low, but the temperatures were still pleasant for the fall day. It was nothing like New York, and Pete couldn't remember when he had spent this much time outside on a southern fall day. He knew it would cool off in the evening, but he hadn't planned to be here for more than one night. He hoped he could get a break to run back to his parents' house and grab a jacket. But there wasn't time for that now. The day had flown by in a flurry of activity. The campers had played more field games, 
Then there was lunch and a chapel service. Now Pete stood just outside the barn while some of the teenagers were preparing to go horseback riding on the trails. The smell and the feel of the barn was familiar. He had begged and begged his parents for a horse when he was ten, but they always said it was too expensive to buy a ten-year-old a horse. He planned to save his own money for it. But he was surprised on his twelfth birthday when his parents and grandparents gave him a horse for a present. That was how he met Mallory. Her parents owned a piece of property in Barnes. Pete's parents had set up to board his horse there. The summer he was twelve, he spent hours there taking care of his horse and learning how to ride. He had seen the owner's daughter around the barn, but she didn't talk much. But Pete said hello one day when he was brushing down his horse after a ride. He asked her if she liked living around all these horses, and that was enough to break the ice. She lit up talking about each horse and how she helped feed and take care of them. After that, Pete talked to Mallory every time he was there. He glanced across the field now and saw Mallory helping a camper get settled on a horse. She stroked the nose of the horse and spoke gently to the animal. She was still the same girl he had said hello to at her parents' barn. I'm the one who changed, he thought. He had also been the one to insist to Hudson that they have horses at the camp. When Hudson asked him to be a board member for the foundation, it was his only stipulation. You'll have to make a generous donation to fund it, Hudson had said with a big smile. Not a problem. Pete's face had been completely serious. The sound of a horse neighing startled him, and he turned to see the horse trainer walking out with a horse pulling against the lead rope. Whoa there, Pete said. Who's this big guy? He asked the trainer. Gideon, the trainer said. He's new around here. He's still getting used to things. Are you sure it's a good idea for someone to ride him? He looks a little unsteady. I can handle it, Mallory appeared and spoke with confidence. I know my way around horses. Of course you do, I remember. Pete locked eyes with her. I was just being cautious. I have a bad feeling about him. Mallory rolled her eyes and took the horse's bridle. Thanks, Brandon, she said to the trainer. She led Gideon around the field for a few minutes. Pete could hear her talking to the horse, and he seemed to calm a bit. Pete let out a breath and tried not to worry. He watched as Mallory mounted the horse and settled into the saddle. The horse shook his head a few times, but then stood still as Mallory tightened the reins. All right, everyone, we're about to head out. Mallory called out to the teens, already mounted on horses. I'll be leading the way to the trail, so fall in behind me. Pete watched as the horses lined up and exited the gate. They were just starting towards the trail when Mallory turned to call out an instruction to the group. The horse seemed nervous once they left the field, and Pete couldn't help noticing. As Mallory turned her head to speak, a dog wandered out from the barn and began barking loudly. Gideon jumped and whined, then began to run. Pete watched in horror as Mallory's face went white. She dug her heels in and held tightly on the reins, but the horse was at a dead run in a moment and headed towards the woods. Without a thought, Pete turned to Brandon, whose eyes were wide with shock. What's your fastest horse? Twilight, that one there. He pointed to a horse that was saddled with one of the teenage boys on it. You, Pete yelled, get down, now. He ran towards the horse, and as the teen dismounted, Pete mounted as fast as he could. He nudged the horse to get him out of the gate, and then let him break out into a run after the other horse. Pete didn't dare take his eyes off Mallory, but her horse was fast, and they were in the woods before Pete could catch up. Pete and Twilight followed into the trees, and Pete could hear the sound of hoofbeats. It was several minutes moving at a quick pace before Pete could see Mallory again. 
They were still a good distance apart when the horse went the wrong way down a trail that ended. When he found himself trapped, the moment Pete had been afraid of came. Gideon whined and bucked his front feet and then his back feet. Mallory managed to hold on until the horse made a sharp turn. The change in direction threw her balance, and she flew off the side of the saddle. Pete watched in horror as her back hit against a tree, and she landed on the ground in a heap. The horse turned and ran off past Pete, but he ignored it as he made his way to Mallory. He jumped off and told his horse to stay as he threw the reins around a tree branch. He ran to Mallory and crouched down to her level. Are you okay? Where does it hurt? Mallory held up her hand to him as she tried to catch her breath. She gasped several times and closed her eyes as she gathered herself. I'm all right, she finally said. I got the wind knocked out of me. Pete looked in her eyes and knew his face matched the fear pounding in his heart. When she met his eyes, a look of recognition flashed across her features. I'm all right, she said again. He knew she was trying to reassure him. She put her hands on the ground to try to stand. Here, let me know. He took her arm in one hand and placed the other on her back. She winced at his touch. Oh, I'm sorry. Mallory looked at him with her teeth clenched. It's all right, I guess I hit my back pretty hard. Yeah, I saw that. His voice was pain. Does anything else hurt? She lifted her arms and moved her wrists around, then turned her head from side to side, assessing her injuries. She lifted each foot and took a few steps. No, I think just my back. You should probably see a doctor. No, I think I'll be all right. I don't know. Better safe than sorry. Come on, Pete. You know I've fallen off a horse before. Yeah, I know. But I actually saw it this time. That was a rough fall. I just want to be sure you're all right. She squinted her eyes at him then. At first, she didn't speak. But she finally straightened up and said, Thanks. I'm sure I'll be all right. Maybe a little sore, but an ice pack and some ibuprofen will probably fix me right up. She looked at him standing in front of her and laughed. You, on the other hand, might want to see a doctor. You're going to remember where all your horse riding muscles are in the morning. How long has it been since you've ridden? Pete chuckled. You're probably right about that. I don't know. How long has it been since the last time we went riding? Mallory dropped her gaze. A long time. Well, that's the last time I rode. Then you probably shouldn't have jumped on a horse for a rescue mission. You know any one of the trainers could have come after me, and I'm fine anyway. Pete rubbed the back of his head. I'm sure they could have. I didn't really think. I just saw that horse take off with you and my instincts kicked in. Mallory looked at him as if she was considering his words. She didn't respond to them, but instead said, How far do you think we are from the barn? A couple of miles, maybe. Do you want to ride back? Mallory jerked her head to look at him and quickly said, No, I can walk. Are you sure? It might take a while. And I don't want you to hurt your back. I'm fine, she said, her tone a little harsh. Okay, Pete shrugged. He walked to his horse and pulled the reins from the tree and began to lead the horse. He turned and waited for Mallory to catch up to him, and they fell in step beside each other as they made their way down the trail. Mallory's back hurt with every step, but she wasn't about to admit that to Pete. What was he doing anyway, rushing after her like a knight in borrowed work boots? She would have been fine without him following her, wouldn't she? She tried to convince herself, but if she was honest, she would have told him how frightened she was when Gideon bolted off, and how she saw her life flash before her eyes as she flew into the tree. She glanced over at Pete. She knew he was walking at a slower pace for her benefit, 
even though he hadn't said anything. She also knew he would walk all the way back to the barn if she didn't give in and ride. How are your parents doing? She asked, desperate for conversation to break the awkward silence. Good. Mom's having a hard time since grandmother passed. She's been going over to her house every day for years, so it's hard to wake up and know you can't do that anymore. I can't imagine. Mallory sniffed. I think a lot of people will miss her. Yes, she was a big part of, she almost said, my life. But she stopped herself and said, this town. What about your parents? Do they still live in town? Yep, right here in Pine Haven. I always knew they would never move. They love small town life. And so do you. Yes. Mallory remembered many conversations where she told him she loved this town and would be happy to stay here even though all he wanted to do was get out. How long have you been teaching? She glanced over at him, wondering how many of these catching up questions he would ask. Three years after, her mind said, I realized you were never coming back. But she said, I finished my education degree at Southern State. I did my student teaching down there, but came back here after I graduated and started at the school. I've been there ever since. I'm glad you found something you enjoy. Have you? She raised her eyebrows as she turned to look at him. Found something you enjoy. Pete stared ahead at the trail, seeming in thought. Yeah, I have. It all started with one app, but it's grown from there. I do a lot more business than designing the apps now, so I kind of miss being more hands-on, but I like what I'm doing. That's good, Mallory mumbled. But Mallory, he stopped and held the horse still as he turned his whole body to face her. You seem happy. I know you love Pine Haven, and I'm glad to see you've made a life here. I am happy, she said. This is where I was always supposed to be. Pete nodded slowly. He looked like he wanted to say something, but he didn't. He turned to continue walking. Pete, she said. I appreciate you coming after me today. Of course. I didn't want you to get hurt. He paused, and his voice dropped low. I know you've already been hurt before. Mallory sighed. She didn't want him to think he could just ride back into her life, but she didn't want to be a bitter person either. I was mad for a long time, and what you did wasn't right. But I have my life now, and you have yours. I'm happy here. I didn't expect you to show up at my camp this weekend and be part of my circle, but I don't think we can go the whole weekend without speaking to each other. So we might as well focus on this weekend instead of the past. Pete rubbed his chin as he listened to her. Well, that's gracious of you. I'm certain I don't deserve that. Mallory gave him a half smile. Well, you know, my mama taught me to be a gracious southern lady. Pete laughed. So you're a southern lady now? She held her chin in the air as she spoke. I've always been a southern lady. He nodded. I agree, you have. But could you put away the part of the southern lady that is incredibly stubborn and ride the horse back to the barn? She turned to him and narrowed her eyes at him. Stubborn? Yes, stubborn. Don't deny it. And don't deny that your back is killing you and that it's going to take us hours to get back at this speed. She sighed. I know, you're right. But it will still take a long time for you to walk beside the horse. There's one solution for that, he said. Her heart pounded at the thought of what she knew he was suggesting. All right, she finally said. Help me up. Pete turned and held the reins as she mounted. He stepped behind her and reached his hands up to her waist to balance her. When she was settled, he put his foot in the stirrup and swung his leg over to sit behind her. Mallory told herself to breathe normally 
as she held on to the saddle. But when his arms came around her to hold the reins, she wondered how she would survive. Everything about this was so familiar. How many times had they ridden together? She remembered more than once when they would start out on the trail on two horses, only for Pete to find an excuse to get the horses close together and slide over to join her. Then she would laugh as he put his arms around her and let herself sink back into him as they rode. But now, the smell of his cologne and the feel of him close to her was more than she could take. She tried to sit up straight and keep a distance between them, but the gait of the horse meant she was bumping into his chest with every step. They didn't speak for several minutes. Pete broke the silence. Are you all right? Is this hurting your back? Only because of the fire it starts every time you touch me, she thought. No, I'm all right. It hurts less than walking. I still think you should go to the doctor. Let's just get back to camp, she said. And they did that, riding in silence the rest of the way. When the barn came into sight, they could see Hudson and Brandon talking just outside. Pete called out, and even at this distance, Mallory could see the relief on their faces. They made it to the barn, and Pete dismounted first, turning to help Mallory down. But she got down without his help and turned to talk to the other men. Mallory, are you all right? Brandon asked. Gideon came running back to the barn without you. We've been so worried. Yes, I'm all right. A little bruised, maybe. He threw me into a tree, and I hit my back. But I'm all right. We should get you to a doctor, Hudson spoke up. That's exactly what I said, Pete agreed. Mallory held up her hand. No, no, I don't think that's necessary. I just need to sit down and put ice on it for a while. I'm sure I'll be all right. Hudson looked skeptical. Really, Hudson, let me rest and ice. I promise if I feel like it's getting worse, I'll go to the doctor. Hudson shook his head. All right, but I'm going to keep checking in with you. Understood. What happened with the campers and the other horses? Pete asked. We led them around the corral for a while. I didn't want them off on the trail when I wasn't sure what would happen, Brandon said. They were a little disappointed, but they were more concerned about Mallory. I'm sorry I made them miss their ride. Maybe we can do it tomorrow? You didn't make them miss it. Gideon did. And really, I feel responsible. I thought he was ready. Obviously, I was wrong. Brandon hung his head. Mallory reached out and put her hand on his arm. Oh, no, it's not your fault. You couldn't have known he would do that. I know you've been working with him and thought he was ready. Brandon looked at the ground, but nodded at her. I'll go get some ice. Thanks. Mallory watched him go, mostly so that she didn't have to turn around and face Pete. She heard a throat clear behind her. I guess I'll go get ready for dinner. Pete said. All right, she finally turned around. See you later. She let him go and fought with herself to be polite. Pete, she called out. He turned and waited for her to speak. Thanks. You're welcome. Then he turned to go. Mallory closed her eyes so she didn't have to watch him. Chapter 8 Pete sat in the back row of the chapel next to his campers as they listened to the worship songs. He had tried his best to put on a brave face during dinner, especially when all the campers wanted the details of his heroic act. But he wasn't a hero. I'm just the guy who left. He had thought about Mallory many times in the years since he left, but he had always been able to push the thoughts aside and convince himself that it would never have worked. The two of them had been together for a long time when they were in high school, so of course it seemed like they would always be together, get married, all that. But they wanted different things. Hadn't they? She had told him over and over that she thought they could stay in Pine Haven forever, and he had never wanted that. 
Sure, he had told her he would come back, but then it had been easier to cut his ties and move away. Easier on who? He could hear the words she had asked him earlier. Was she right? Had it just been easier on him to be a coward? He didn't like to think of himself that way, but maybe it was true. Still, he had a good life. Running a successful business and living in a big city had always been his dream. And now he was more successful than he could have imagined. What started as a single app had grown into a multi-billion dollar social media conglomerate. He couldn't be happier, could he? His thoughts were interrupted when Hudson called everyone's attention to the front. Tonight is our last night of the retreat, and I know you're all anxious to get out to the bonfire. Shouts from around the room proved he was right. All right, all right. He motioned for them to calm down. But we need to give our attention to Gavin first and listen to what he has to share with us tonight. The students clapped and cheered as Gavin came to the front. I know you're excited about tonight, and you should be. We're celebrating, and it's always fun to party and celebrate together. But I want to share a story about a time of celebration. He paused as he opened up his Bible and set it on the podium beside him. Pete squirmed a little in his seat. He hadn't been to church in a long time. And even though he knew that Hudson ran a Christian camp, he still hadn't expected someone to pull out the Bible. Jesus had a lot of people who followed him. They listened to him teach. They traveled around to see him. And they brought people to him to be healed. But Jesus also had a very special and small group of friends that he was close with, the 12 disciples. So when it came time for the Passover, which is a special Jewish celebration that includes a meal, well, really a feast, who do you think Jesus wanted to celebrate with? He glanced around, waiting for someone to answer. Finally, a voice spoke up. His friends? That's right. He wanted to celebrate with his friends. It's kind of like when it's Thanksgiving or Fourth of July and you want to hang out with your people, make a big meal and enjoy being together. But this celebration was important. The Jewish celebration of Passover came from way back when the Jews were in captivity in Egypt. You might have heard that story, but in case you haven't, I'll give you a refresher. The Egyptian pharaoh had the Jews captured as slaves. But God sent Moses to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. Pharaoh refused. So God sent ten plagues on the Egyptians. Things like water turned to blood, a plague of frogs, all the animals dying. Some really terrible things. But the last one was the worst of all. God said that he was sending the angel of death and that the firstborn son of each household would die. He glanced around the room, letting that sink in. Now, if you were the parents of a house, or you were the oldest son, or you had a brother who you cared about, this would be really scary. But God provided a way out. He told the Jewish people to go out and sacrifice a lamb, and then to smear the blood over the outside doorway of their home. He motioned with his hands to explain, and then they were to stay inside their home and keep the door shut. So that night, the angel of death came through Egypt, and every firstborn Egyptian son died. But a miracle happened. Every one of the houses of the Jews, the ones with blood over the door, the angel passed over those houses, and the firstborn son was spared. He ran the back of his hand across his forehead, as if wiping off sweat. So the Jewish people have a celebration called Passover to celebrate that God passed over the Jews and rescued them. So Jesus got together with his disciples to share a meal for Passover. But that night he told them that he would soon be leaving them. The disciples didn't know what to think. But that very night, Jesus would be arrested and taken away by the authorities, even though he had done no wrong. And then he would be crucified on a cross. Now, why do you think he would allow that to happen? 
Jesus had healed many people from being sick and he had done many miracles. So don't you think he could have gotten away from those soldiers? Don't you think he could have used his power to take himself off the cross? Well, yes, I believe he could have, but he didn't. He chose to die and to take on the punishment for all our sins. So when we ask Jesus to come in and take over our lives and forgive our sins, it's like the blood over the doorway. Death passes over us. Of course, we will all die one day, but that's not what I mean. I mean eternal death. The Bible tells us there are two paths when we die, heaven or hell. Now, I'm not trying to scare you, but hell is a real place. I don't think I need to tell you that it won't be fun. But heaven is also a real place, a wonderful, beautiful place. And all God's people will be there together one day. And it will be an incredible celebration. So I just think it would be a shame for us to spend the weekend together having fun, playing games, enjoying camp, and then not tell you the best thing you'll ever hear in life. And that's that you can know Jesus. You can belong to him, walk with him in this life, talk to him, and then be with him forever in eternity. It's really an easy thing to do. You just have to ask God to forgive you of your sins and give your life to him. If that's something you want to do tonight, you can talk to me or Hudson or to any of the counselors. I'll close with this. We've talked a lot about success and what that means. But the Bible says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. That means that you can have what the world considers a successful life. You can have money, possessions. You can even be rich and famous. It can look good on the outside, but without Jesus, none of it matters. That's not the kind of success I want. I only want the success that comes from walking with Jesus. Gavin went on to pray and wrap up the session but Pete kept hearing the same words over and over. You can know Jesus. He had grown up in church. He had always heard more about the rules he had to follow to be a good Christian. He hadn't been a bad kid, but he didn't like the idea of some almighty being telling him what to do all the time. But the way Gavin talked made it sound a lot more appealing. What if there is more than just living a successful life? What if I'm missing out on something? If there was anything Pete hated, it was missing an opportunity. He felt a stirring inside that he should think more about this. But he pushed it aside as the campers began to get up from their seats. They were heading out to the bonfire for the rest of the night. Pete walked alongside his campers outside and down the hill to the bonfire. There were built-in benches in a circle around the fire. Campers took seats on the benches or stood near the fire, a few huddled in groups on the edge of the lights. Pete watched as other campers and counselors approached. He saw Mallory on the other side of the fire. Brandon, the trainer, came over and handed her sticks for roasting marshmallows. The two of them worked together, prepping s'mores for the campers. Pete felt jealousy wash over him. It was the same jealousy he had felt when he saw Mallory put her hand on Brandon's arm that afternoon. Mallory's laugh rang out in the air. Brandon smiled. Pete assumed he had just told a joke, but he wasn't close enough to hear. It was just as well. He had seen her face during the worship music, and seeing it tonight made him think maybe he had never been the man for her. Being around the students all weekend made Pete think about his own teenage years. He grinned inwardly as he remembered what he had been like in high school. He had always known he wanted to do something big and important something that would give him his own name and his own identity and something that would get him out of Pine Haven. Sure, he hadn't minded being popular in the small high school. He wasn't an athlete or the prom king, but people knew him and liked him. His own group of friends was part of the popular crowd, and Pete played his role well. He walked the halls with confidence in himself and where he was going in life. 
and he took it on himself to make sure everybody was laughing and entertained along the way. Another thought came, and he sighed, wondering if he had been a good person then. Maybe he had made jokes at others' expense, and maybe he had made his own plans more important than someone else's feelings. He let that thought hang in his mind as he watched the embers from the fire floating up to the sky. Another maybe floated into his mind. Maybe Hudson was right when he said I was supposed to be here this weekend. But I sure don't know what God's plan is right now. Chapter 9 He rode after you on the horse and brought you back to camp? Lacey's eyes were wide with surprise as Mallory recounted the story. The two friends were catching up over lunch on Monday during their teaching break. Yep. Mallory said. I know it sounds heroic, but it was also one of the most awkward experiences of my life. Any other person and I would have been thrilled, but with Pete, I couldn't decide whether to be grateful or mad that he was still there. Wow, Lacey said, around a bite of her sandwich. Did you talk afterward? Are you going to see him again? Mallory shook her head. We didn't talk much after we got back. There was chapel and the bonfire. But then Sunday morning we didn't have any more group activities before the campers left, she sighed. Besides, I didn't really have anything else to say. I mean, yes, I'm grateful that he helped me at that moment. All those years of horseback riding training kicked in, I guess. But he's still Pete Collins so I'm not going to just fall all over myself. She wrapped up the trash from her lunch and packed it into her lunch bag. Anyway, I'm sure he'll be headed back to New York soon, then I'll probably never see him again. Lacey nodded in agreement. But if you had a choice, would you want to see him again? Mallory paused as she thought, then shrugged. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Yes, but a week ago you would have said definitely not, so saying I don't know tells me that you would consider it. Consider what? I don't know. Just consider seeing him again? Mallory sighed again. I have to admit I wouldn't mind having some answers for why he did what he did, but not so there would be a possibility of anything happening, just so there could be closure. Lacey reached over and patted her on the hand. It's all right. We can drop it. Mallory wished her brain would drop it. She hadn't thought of much else besides Pete for days. From seeing him at the funeral to watching him come riding to her rescue, just being around him did funny things to her heart, no matter how much she fought against it. Anyway, Lacey said, we're still on for tonight, right? Karaoke? Mallory groaned. Oh, I don't know. I'm so tired from the weekend and I have tons of laundry to catch up on. Come on. You promised me last week that you would go this time. You can't back out on me now. Lacey whined. Can't we do it next week? Or can't we do something else like hang out at my house and watch a movie? Nope. Lacey said her face serious. We're not old maids. We are young and fun, and we are going to karaoke nights. Oh, all right. What time? Seven. Don't be late. Mallory nodded as she turned towards her classroom. She spent the rest of the afternoon teaching the students that she loved, but Pete seemed to invade her thoughts. For five years, she had wondered what it would be like to see him again, now that she had, she both hoped it was the last time and wished it wasn't. Either way, it's outside of my control. He does what he wants, and that's that. At the end of the day, she took her time leaving her class and making her way to her car. As she drove down Main Street, she glanced at the shops and restaurants there, as she did every day. 
Passing through the older section of town, she admired the houses that had stood for more years than her parents had been alive. She would never get tired of seeing them. Many times, she had thought about being able to buy one and live there. But that wasn't likely to happen on her teacher's salary. She almost made the turn toward her parents' home and farm, but decided against it and instead continued on the road to her own apartment, just outside of the main part of town. Inside, she dropped her keys in the basket on the entryway table and put her bag away in her room before walking to the living room and crashing on the couch. Mallory breathed out heavily as she lay staring at the ceiling. The weekend at camp had been exhausting in every way. Physically and emotionally, she was tired. The pain in her back radiated as she laid down, and she rolled over to her side to lessen the pressure. She had seen the bruises in the mirror that morning and knew it would be a while before she was back to normal. But she was thankful nothing seemed to be broken. Trying to drown out the thoughts in her mind, she flipped on the television and found a sitcom rerun. Maybe Lacey's right. I am turning into an old maid. When evening rolled around and she was dressed to go meet her friend, she still wished she could stay home and rest. But she wasn't going to break her promise. So she grabbed her purse and headed out the door. She arrived at the Pine Haven Grill and found it was packed that night. Lacey had told her that karaoke night was popular, but it still surprised her. She managed to find a parking spot and squeezed her way in. She didn't see Lacey right away and began walking through the room looking for her friend. The restaurant was dimly lit for the occasion. Round tables around the room were filled with people and the stools at the bar counter seemed to be the only space open. After another glance around the tables and deciding that Lacey hadn't arrived yet, Mallory took a seat on one of the high top stools. She put her purse on the seat next to her to save it for Lacey. She turned around in the seat to face the elevated stage on the opposite side of the room. It was lit up with neon lights and two microphones on stands stood on the stage. Mallory could only hope that Lacey wouldn't force her up there. She swiveled back around to the counter and pulled out her phone to text Lacey. Where are you? She waited a minute for a response, but when none came, she put her phone on the counter and turned around as she heard someone speaking into the microphone. But she didn't notice the person on the stage. As she turned, she only saw one person standing a few feet away from her, Pete. He saw her at the same moment she saw him, and they locked eyes. Surprised washed over her face but he didn't seem to notice as he walked closer. Hey, he said, his voice sounding as casual as if they saw each other here all the time. Hey, was all she could manage to say back. You come here often? He smirked as he leaned one hand on the counter. Goodness, no. My friend Lacey made me promise to come with her tonight, but she isn't here yet. She checked her phone again, to see that Lacey still hadn't replied. What are you doing here? Pete shrugged. I'm here for a few more days, helping my parents settle my grandmother's estate. I asked Hudson what there was to do in town, and he said this was the busiest place on karaoke night. And you like singing karaoke? Mallory raised her eyebrows at him. No, not me. But it's fun to watch other people. It's like one of those singing show auditions. Mallory accidentally let a laugh escape her lips. Oh, you do still laugh then. She cleared her throat. Of course. So what about you? You planning to get up there and perform for the crowd? No way. This is Lacey's thing, not mine. I'm just here to support her. Lacey Simmons? Yep, Lacey Simmons. I remember her. I don't remember you two being close. We weren't that close in high school, but we were friends. But we started teaching at the elementary school at the same time, so we've gotten close. 
That's nice, Pete said. He dropped his gaze to the floor as if he wasn't sure what to say next. Mallory fiddled with her phone again. She typed out another text. Seriously, where are you? Mind if I sit down? Pete gestured to the chair with Mallory's purse. Well, um, I'm saving it for Lacey. That's all right. I can move when she gets here. Just thought maybe I could keep you company until then. Mallory stared at him. What was he doing? Did he really want to talk here on a loud karaoke night? Still, she didn't want to be rude. All right, sure, I guess. She picked up her purse and held it in her lap. She was sure she must look like she would bolt any minute. But she wasn't sure she wouldn't, so she held on to her purse. Pete sat and then turned to the young man behind the counter and waved to get his attention. Could I get a sweet tea? And he turned to Mallory and lifted his eyebrows expectantly. Want something? Oh, um, well, her stomach grumbled at that moment. She had planned to wait on Lacey, but decided to order anyway. Sure, I'd like a Coke to drink and an order of chicken nachos. That sounds good. I'll have chicken nachos, too. Mallory eyed Pete as the server walked away to put in their orders. Sweet tea, huh? She said. Pete smiled. Yep, can't get that in New York. So there are some things you miss from Alabama. He turned and met her gaze. Yes, there are. She stared back at him and spoke boldly, just not enough to come back and see them. Pete sighed and stared at the back wall. Listen. No, I'm sorry. Mallory held up her hand. I shouldn't have said that. I don't want to get into that. Let's just talk about something else. She shook her head. Or not talk at all. We don't have to talk. Pete's expression was sad. But he turned around and faced the stage. Let's listen, then talk about the singers. That could be fun. Mallory wasn't sure about that. But as the first few singers performed, she couldn't help but watch Pete's facial expressions. He would grit his teeth at every missed note and bob his head to the rhythm when they got behind the music. She smiled just a little bit. But when the next song came on, Pete's eyes grew wide and he slowly turned his head towards Mallory. She knew what he was thinking. This was a song they had sung along to many times during high school. He stood up and animatedly began to lip-sync along with the singer on stage. How do you like me now? Now that I'm on my way, he mouthed the words. When the chorus came, he threw his head back and sang out loud terribly off-key. Mallory couldn't help it then. She burst out laughing. When the song came to an end, he bowed several times and pretended to wave to fans out across an audience. Mallory giggled as he took his seat next to her. Very nice performance, she said. Thank you, thank you, Pete said. As he took his seat, he returned to his character as a television judge and announced only to Mallory. Now our next contestant is all the way from Pine Haven, Alabama. They both watched as a young woman, probably in her late teens, approached the microphone. This young lady is the pride and joy of hickory pigs, farms, and tannery. Mallory put her hand over her mouth so she wouldn't laugh. She had forgotten about Pete's goofy sense of humor. He sounded like he was from New York, but that southern charm was still underneath. Another half hour passed with Pete making a commentary on the singer's. Most of them would never score a musical recording contract, and they knew it. But Pete kept Mallory laughing with his critiques, keeping the humor without being cruel. She had wanted to stay mad at him, and really she was, but she let herself enjoy the moment just a little. What do you think happened to your friend? Pete asked. 
Oh, goodness, I don't know. She grabbed her phone and checked to see that she had two texts from Lacey. The first just said, On my way. Mallory didn't get a chance to read the second because Lacey appeared through the crowd at that moment. Hey, Lacey shouted. I'm so sorry. She seemed to notice Pete then and looked back and forth between him and Mallory. What's going on? Nothing, Mallory said quickly. Lacey, you remember Pete Collins? Of course. Hi, she nodded to Pete. Hey, Lacey. Good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Lacey spoke slowly as she turned her attention to Mallory. We just bumped into each other and he was going to sit here until you got here. But you're here now, so... Mallory turned to Pete. Oh yeah, I don't want to interrupt your night, Pete said. It was nice hanging out with you, Mallory. Yeah, you too. Mallory was surprised that the statement was true. I'll see you later. Okay. Mallory watched as Pete picked up his sweet tea and walked across the room. She couldn't pull her eyes away. Hello? Lacey finally interrupted her. Hey, Mallory said and turned to her friend. Hey. Just then, she remembered why she had been sitting with Pete in the first place. Where in the world have you been? I'm so sorry. I was working on lesson plans and grading a quiz we had in class today, and I fell asleep on my couch. I guess I needed the nap because when I woke up, I was already late. You fell asleep. Who's an old maid now? Mallory laughed. I know, I know. Lacey shook her head as she took a seat. I'm lame and tired. But forget that. Tell me how in the world I show up late to meet you and you're sitting here laughing with your ex-boyfriend who left town and you said you never wanted to see again. Mallory put her elbows on the counter and let her face fall into her hands. Ugh, I know. I didn't mean to. I was just waiting for you and he was just right there in front of me so he took a seat and we started talking. And? And what? What did you talk about? Is he trying to win you back? Lacey's eyes were wide. No, no, no. We didn't talk about anything, really. Just listen to the singers. And what are you thinking about him now? Nothing, Mallory lied. Lacey tilted her head and raised her eyebrows. Come on, be for real. Mallory rolled her eyes. Okay, okay, I mean it's hard not to think that he looks good, and he made me laugh. She sighed as she looked away. He always could make me laugh. Yes, but how long did he make you cry? Mallory sighed. I know, you're right, but really it doesn't matter. He'll be gone in a few days, and we can both go back to our normal lives as aspiring old maids. Nope, not yet. Lacey stood and grabbed Mallory's arm. We're going to put our names on the list to sing. Your choice, Shania Twain or Carrie Underwood? Mallory laughed. Oh no, I don't think so. Come on, it'll be fun. Nope. You were late, so I win this one. I get to sit here on this stool. But I'll be happy to watch you sing. Lacey rolled her eyes. Oh fine, you win. I'm going to sign up. Be right back. Mallory watched Lacey go before she turned around to sip her drink. Only a moment later, she heard a male voice clearing his throat. She turned to see Pete behind her. Hey, he said. Sorry, I won't keep you. I just wanted to say I had fun tonight. Mallory tried to stifle the grin, creeping up her face. Yeah, me too. She could say that much, right? He was leaving anyway. What could it hurt? So, um, I was wondering if maybe we could have fun again? Confusion came over Mallory's face. I mean, it would be nice to see you again. I mean, not see you, see you, but... He stammered. Mallory had never seen him flustered like this. 
Pete had been calm and confident since the first day she met him, and he never faltered with his words. She met his eyes and spoke, What are you asking? I know that you were close with my grandmother. She always liked you, and I'm glad that you stayed close. I know we had the funeral, but we're having a small gathering for family and close friends on Thursday night. It won't be like a funeral. We want it to be a fun night of sharing memories and stories. I'm sure she would have wanted you to be there. Oh, thank you. So will you come? His voice was earnest and his expression almost pleading. Mallory stared at him, unable to speak. Please, he said. She sighed and nodded. Yes, of course. Chapter 10 Pete stood outside his parents' house, pacing back and forth. He glanced at his phone and typed a quick response to an email. He could hear voices from inside the house as the small gathering of people filled up the house. He turned again to pace the sidewalk. He couldn't shake the nerves he felt. What am I doing? He thought. She's obviously moved on with her life, and from all indications, she doesn't want to see me. Still, every moment of the past few days, he had thought of her. He knew he should try to just get her out of his mind, but the truth was he didn't want to. A car pulled into the driveway then, and he waited as they parked. Then he watched as Mallory stood up from the vehicle. Her red hair was easy to recognize, even at this distance. His eyes ran over her as he saw her soft curls where they fell around her shoulders. She wore a navy blue dress with leggings and dark brown boots. She came up the driveway and looked up to see him standing there. Hi, Pete said. You look nice. Thank you. She brushed her hair behind her shoulders, and he thought he saw a slight blush come across her cheeks. Are you waiting on something out here? Mallory glanced from him to the house. Um, yeah, sort of. You, actually. Mallory gave him a hard stare. I can find my way in. It's all right. I didn't mind waiting. I don't know a lot of the people here anyway. But you know me? Pete took one step closer and their eyes met. Well, I used to, anyway. Well, things change, Mallory said, her voice dropping to a low volume. He stepped back and turned to the house. Coming? She followed him, seeming reluctant, but they made it upstairs and through the front door. Inside, the noise swelled. There were probably 30 people in the room, Pete's parents and aunts and uncles and cousins, then a few people from town who had been close to his grandmother. Pete's mother made her way over when she saw them. Mallory. Susan gave Mallory a quick hug. I'm so glad you could join us. I know my mother thought very highly of you. I thought highly of her, too. She was an incredible woman. Yes, she was. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Of course, I was thrilled when Peter told me you were coming. Her eyes twinkled as she mentioned her son. Mallory cleared her throat. Yes, well, I'm glad to be here. Come on in. We have food and drinks in the kitchen. We're going to share some stories in a little bit. Susan left them to attend to her hostessing duties. Are you hungry? Pete asked. Oh, no, I'm fine, Mallory said. Really, the kitchen is full of food. All kinds of things. At least come and get something to drink. Oh, and there's a table full of desserts. I know you can't resist chocolate. Mallory gave him a smirk that said he was right. Oh, all right. Maybe just a little something. Pete put his hand on the small of her back as he guided her through the crowd. Tingles shot through his arm at the light touch. In the kitchen, he watched her face light up 
and she just barely licked her lips at the side of the chocolate cake with chocolate frosting. He smiled and turned to get a glass and added ice and sweet tea. He handed it to her without a word. She eyed him curiously, but didn't say anything either. Hello, Mallory. Pete's Aunt Cheryl walked into the kitchen and gave Mallory a quick hug. And hello, Pete. She turned and hugged her nephew before giving him a kiss on the cheek. Then she stopped and looked at the two of them. Oh, I'm glad you could be here tonight. I just have to say I'm just beside myself to see the two of you here together. She wiggled her eyebrows up and down and beamed with a smile from ear to ear. Oh, no, Mallory said firmly. We're not together. Oh, Cheryl said. But you're in the same room, so that's new. Maybe it won't be long before you're together. Together? She smiled again and then picked up a chocolate chip cookie and walked from the room. Um, Pete stared after his aunt, afraid to look at Mallory. Is that what you're doing? Using your grandmother's memorial to try to get me back? He turned and saw the darts she was shooting from her eyes. No, not at all. He held his hands up to prove his innocence. I just really thought you would enjoy being here tonight. Because, Pete, listen, it's not going to happen. You left town and I expected you to come back. I know, he said quietly, but he didn't drop eye contact. Do you? Her voice rose a notch. Because we spent all of high school saying we were going to spend the rest of our lives together. We talked about the future and what we wanted out of life. Then one day you went to New York and you never came back. And you didn't even have the decency to tell me it was over or give me any kind of explanation. I know, he repeated. He couldn't help himself. He reached both hands out and gripped her shoulders. She stepped back away from him. I never planned to do that, really, and I never wanted to hurt you. I just... He paused and glanced over his shoulder as someone entered the kitchen. The woman fixed herself a drink and then left the room. Pete stepped closer to Mallory until he could lean close to her ear. Could we go somewhere and talk? His deep voice was gruff. Pete could feel her breathing, and when he stepped back to look her in the eyes, he really thought she was going to say yes. No, she said. She walked past him into the living room and found a seat in the back corner. He stood in the doorway and watched her for a moment, but then his mother called for everyone's attention. Thank you for coming tonight, Susan began. I know many of you were at my mother's funeral service, and we were so grateful to everyone. It was a wonderful service and a lovely tribute to who my mother was as a southern lady and as a part of this town. But we wanted to gather tonight and share some stories about Mom. Maybe some things we wouldn't have shared at the funeral. If you haven't already, grab something to eat and drink and feel free to come in and out as we talk. This is very informal. So make yourself at home. I'll just open it up to anyone who has a story they want to share. I'll start. Jennifer, Pete's sister, stood. So anyone who knew my grandmother knows how particular she was. Around the room, heads nodded. She didn't like for her schedule to be changed or for her plans to get derailed. Jennifer went on to share about her grandmother taking a fall after a run-in with a grocery cart and needed to be taken in an ambulance. The poor EMTs were trying to get her on the stretcher, and she was bossing them around and telling them to make sure and get her purse. Then she sits back on the stretcher, looks at the man, and says, Son, now I know you're supposed to do your job and take me to the ambulance, but I have five more items on my list, so here you go. And then she waved him off while the other EMT wheeled her out of the store. And that poor man took her purse and her grocery cart and finished her shopping. Laughter erupted around the room. Grandpa had to come meet him outside and pick up the groceries. 
Jennifer sat down, and Pete stepped up. That's always been one of my favorite grandma stories. But since Jen shared that one, I'll just say that my grandmother was a woman who knew what she wanted. But she also cared about people and knew how to see what they really needed. I'm not the only grandkid, but I remember whenever I went to spend the night at Grandma's house, she would make sure to have my favorite cookies, chocolate chip, and we would play my favorite board game, and my sister tells me Grandma would have Oreos for her, and they would stay up late watching movies. She made it an individual treat for each of us. He paused and cleared his throat. I always knew that my grandparents loved me. They made sure of that. They taught me that family was the most important thing. The thing about Grandma, though, was that she loved to take everyone in. So anyone she knew well became family. He paused and glanced over at Mallory, who sat perfectly still listening to him speak. He didn't take his eyes off of her as he finished speaking. I hope that's a trait I can take from her and continue on. Pete stepped back and leaned against the wall as his uncle began another story. Person after person shared about his grandmother, and his grandfather, too. Some of them were so funny, everyone in the room was in hysterics, and others were more heartwarming. Pete listened as each person spoke, but he kept stealing glances across the room. When it seemed that they might run out of stories, Susan spoke again. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. You're welcome to stay as long as you would like. There's still food, and we can share more stories, but I know some of you have to get to work in the morning. So we'll say good night for anyone who needs to go. Pete glanced at his watch and saw that it was almost 11 p.m. Most everyone continued to talk and mill about the room. He pushed away from the wall and went towards the front door when he saw Mallory heading that way. She made it to the door before he did, but he caught it as she pulled it shut. Mallory, he said. She stopped and turned her head to acknowledge him, but she continued walking, so he followed her out to the porch. Please, he said, can we just talk? I don't know what good that'll do. She said, Mallory, please. He reached out and took her arm. She didn't pull away, and he led her to the side of the front porch where he sat on one of the rocking chairs. Mallory seemed hesitant to sit down, but he motioned to the chair beside him, and she took a seat. Pete, it's been five years. I think it's just too late for this. I know I shouldn't have left without saying goodbye, and I shouldn't have waited this long to talk to you, but it was just too hard. You have to know that's why I've stayed away. Because of me? Her eyebrows shot up, and she put her palm on her chest. You can't blame me for that. No, no, I don't mean I blame you. I just mean that I stayed away because I knew I wouldn't be able to leave town again if I saw you. What do you mean? Pete sighed and leaned back in his chair. He took a minute before he looked at her again and spoke. I know we talked about forever, and that's what I wanted then. But I also wanted to get out of this town. The more we talked and the closer it came for me to graduate and decide what to do with my life, the more I knew you really wanted to stay here. But I said I would go where you wanted to go. I know you did, and I believed you, but I knew you would regret it. And as much as I cared about you, I didn't want to make you do that. But I also knew that if I came back here after college, I would never be able to leave. So when I had the chance to meet with an investor, I went to New York. And when he agreed to the deal, I knew I wanted to stay. He paused and stared off into the darkness beyond the front porch. I told myself that I would come back here and propose and take you back to New York. But when I told you I was going to New York for the meeting, the last thing you said to me was that you couldn't wait for me to come home. I remember, Mallory practically whispered. I knew you would always want me to come home. 
but I didn't want to come back here. He rubbed his forehead between his forefinger and thumb. I know it wasn't right, but I decided that I needed to cut ties here and stay in New York, and I just couldn't bring myself to talk to you about it. I was too afraid you would convince me to come home. Mallory stared at him in the darkness. Pete thought he noticed a glimmer of tears in her eyes. I'm sorry, Mallory. I handled it wrong, and I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that to you. He sighed. And no, I'm not trying to use my grandmother's memorial to get you back. I don't think that's possible. But I did want you to know what happened. Maybe one day you can forgive me for that. Maybe not. But I'm sorry. He stood then and walked towards the door. Just before he reached for the doorknob, he turned back. Goodbye, Mallory. I wish you all the best. Chapter 11 Pete sat in his office in the New York high-rise, just like he had every day in the week since he returned from Alabama. He stared at the computer screen in front of him, trying to focus. But the words ran together on the page. The word many began to look like Mallory, and he pushed away from his desk and went to stand at the window. This is why I never went back, he told himself. But now there was no way to turn back time and not see her again. Every time he had seen Mallory, he only wanted to see her again. But Pinehaven wasn't the place for him, and he couldn't let her pull him back there. He sighed as he stared out the window and remembered his dream from the night before. He had been standing in front of Mallory, begging her to let him back into her life. When she finally said yes, he took her into his arms and kissed her. He could almost feel her lips on his and the strands of her hair running through his fingers as he pulled her close. He would have sworn he could smell her perfume right up until he woke up in his apartment, alone. There was a beep on his office phone then, and his assistant spoke over the speaker. Mr. Collins, there's an Andrew Hartley on the phone for you. He says he's a friend from Alabama. Oh, sure, put him through. A few clicks sounded, and then he heard the call connect. Andrew, what's up, man? Hey, Pete, thanks for taking my call. Of course, it's good to hear from you. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to see you while you were in town. Heard about your grandmother. I'm sorry for your loss. Thanks. I wasn't there too long, though. Maybe next time, Andrew said. Pete didn't think there would be a next time. What can I do for you? I'm sure you know, but my family owns a lot of the property downtown here, and we're looking at doing some renovations. You know, sprucing up the area, that sort of thing. My grandfather passed away a few months back, and control of most of the properties was left to me. I'm sorry about your grandfather. I know how you feel. Thanks. Andrew cleared his throat before continuing. I have some uh, business ideas, but I would... Love to have someone to talk them through with, someone who knows the town and what might work here, but also someone who sees things bigger than Pinehaven, if you know what I mean. Pete sighed. Yeah, I know what you mean. So I wondered if you might be available to discuss some ideas. Maybe tell me if I'm on the right track or off my rocker a mile and a half. I appreciate you thinking of me, and I would be happy to help you if I can. But, you know, I haven't been in Pinehaven for years. I'm not sure I know the town like I used to. He paused. Are you looking for investors? I'm not sure yet. We're just in the idea stage right now. I see. Well, feel free to call me to chat. I'm not planning to be in town anytime soon. But you could talk with Hudson Jennings if you met him. He would be a great resource since he's in town and he's a genius with business and investments. That's a great idea. I've met him a couple of times, but I don't really know him. I'll send you his contact info and I'll let him know you'll be calling him. 
Thanks, Pete. I appreciate it. No problem. They talked for a few more minutes, catching up on life, and then Pete said goodbye, promising to send over Hudson's info. He sighed as he placed the phone on its cradle. For so long, he had avoided his hometown. Now it seemed to come knocking at every turn. Why couldn't he put it out of his mind just like he'd done for years? The door to his office opened, and Pete put his hands over his face when Hudson came walking in. What are you doing here? Come to give me another reminder of home? Hudson narrowed his eyes as he walked to the chair and sat opposite his friend. What are you talking about? Pete leaned back in his chair and breathed out loudly. I just feel like Pine Haven is calling out to me. And why shouldn't it? It's a great place. You're the one who introduced me to it. I know, and look how that has worked out for me. Hudson leaned forward on the desk. All right, man, I'm lost. Tell me what's going on. Well, you know Mallory. Hudson's grin spread across his face. Yep. Don't smirk like that. Hudson laughed. Then he stopped and waved his hand in front of his face and put on a serious expression. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm ready now. Go. I can't stop thinking about her. Ever since my grandmother's funeral, she's on my mind all the time. I even dream about her. Really? Hudson's eyes were wide. Yes, really. So pick up the phone. Jump in your private jet and fly to Alabama. Or just jump in my private jet when I fly back tomorrow. I'm just here for a board meeting in the morning. Pete covered his face with his hands. I can't do that. Why not? Hudson challenged him. My life is here. My business is here. Everything I've worked for is here. and I've worked hard to not be there. Hudson shrugged. Things change. Things change is all you have to say? Yep. That's not helpful. Yes, it is, Hudson said. Things change. People change. You can change your mind about what you want. It's just life. But what if we've changed too much? I left town and didn't say goodbye. I'm pretty sure she won't forgive me for that. You might be surprised. Sometimes people are more willing to forgive when you ask for forgiveness. Hudson raised his eyebrows and tilted his head as if waiting for a response. I did ask her to forgive me. Pete's voice dropped to a near whisper. And what did she say? Nothing. I said I was sorry, and I hoped she could forgive me someday, and then I left. Hudson jumped up from his seat. You left? What if she was about to say, I forgive you, stay here forever? Pete shook his head and almost smiled. I don't think so. But you don't know, because you didn't wait to find out. I didn't need to. I already know. Pete stood and paced his office. Besides, I think she likes someone else. Who? Hudson asked. I saw her with Brandon, the trainer at camp. They seemed pretty close. Hudson watched Pete pacing until Pete turned and he noticed. What? Brandon. Yes. Did you ask her about that? No. Of course not. Hudson threw his hands up in the air. You haven't given her a chance to talk or respond to what you're thinking. So you know something about her and Brandon? Yep. But if you want to know, you should ask her. Pete shook his head. I don't have any right to ask that of her. And if she's with him and she's happy, I'm not going to step in and ruin it. So if there's something I should know, you need to tell me. Hudson looked like he was considering this. All right, I'll tell you, but only to prove you're being an idiot. Fine, I'll accept that. Brandon liked Mallory the first time he met her when she started volunteering at camp. They seemed to hit it off right off the bat, and I even thought they seemed like a good match. 
They probably worked together for a year before Brandon finally asked her out. They went out a few times, but there just weren't any sparks. They both agreed to be friends. And they both told me at separate times that they thought of each other as brother and sister. Which seemed to work out nicely since Mallory introduced him to her sister, who he proposed to over the summer. Pete snapped his head up to look at Hudson. Then he slowly lowered his gaze to the floor. Oh, so you see, you might not know everything you think you know. I would suggest you give her a chance to talk instead of just running your mouth and then leaving. Pete sank into his chair. That's a little harsh. Hudson sat back down too. Maybe, but I don't know if anyone else will tell you the truth. You made the decision to leave town, but if you want her back, maybe you need to let her make a decision. I can't go back there. Why not? It's a great place. In fact, it's my favorite place in the world. Pete didn't have an answer. Hudson sighed as he stood. I didn't come by to say all that. I came by to tell you I'm in town tonight and see if you wanted to grab dinner. Shannon stayed home this time, so it's just me. Sure, we can grab dinner. I kind of hate that I told you about my hometown in the first place. Now I lost my best friend. You haven't lost me. You just have to travel to see me. Besides, do you really wish you hadn't let me find my own hometown and the love of my life? Of course not. I'm happy for you. You know that. Yes, I do. I just wish you were as kind to yourself as you were to me. He paused as he opened the door. I'll see you for dinner. Text me what time and where. You're the New Yorker now, so you pick. Pete stared at the door long after Hudson walked out and closed it. Was it true that he wasn't being kind to himself by staying away? And was it possible Mallory might surprise him if he gave her the chance? He didn't know. And he wasn't sure if he was willing to find out. The words of Gavin came to his mind. That's not the kind of success I want. I only want the success that comes from walking with Jesus. Am I doing it all wrong? Pete thought. I've worked for this my whole life, and I love what I do. But what if what I really want is what Hudson has, a relationship with Jesus and a small-town life with someone I love? Chapter 12 the bell rang, signaling the end of the day, and Mallory watched her students grab their backpacks and exit the classroom. She took her time straightening up the room and gathering her things. Lacey poked her head in to see if she wanted to walk out with her. Thanks, but I'm not finished here yet. I'll be a little bit longer, so you go ahead. Lacey stood at the door and looked like she wanted to say something. Finally, she asked, Are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Just moving slow today. No reason to rush home, I guess. Mallory shrugged. She knew how pitiful the last part sounded. Lacey started to speak. No, I know what I said. It's fine, really. It's okay. She had been in a mood ever since Pete left. Why had she let him get to her like this? She had been doing fine for a long time now, Sure, she hadn't been fine when he first went to New York. She waited for him to come home. And then she spent almost two weeks wondering why she hadn't heard from him and why he wasn't returning her calls. She would never forget the day she went to his parents' house and knocked on the door. Susan came to the door, and when she saw Mallory, her face fell. Is he all right? Mallory asked as fast as she could get the words out. I've been so worried. Susan stepped out on the porch and said the words that caused Mallory's world to come crashing down. He's fine, but Mallory, I'm sorry he's not coming back. Now in her classroom, thinking of those words hurt as bad as it had five years ago, but she had gotten over it. She had gone to school and gotten a job. She was happy here. She loved her work, and she still loved this town. 
Mallory sighed as she put her bag over her shoulder and walked out of her class. Maybe if she hadn't loved this town so much, Pete would have asked her to go with him. If she had been willing to let go, maybe they could have made it work. Was that what she really wanted? She didn't even have an answer for herself. She climbed in her car and pulled out of the parking lot, but she didn't want to go home. Instead, she drove through town and found a spot to park on Main Street. She climbed out and breathed in the chill of the fall air. She decided walking through downtown and window shopping was the anecdote for her mood. She popped in a couple of shops on Main Street and browsed before heading to the coffee shop. Mallory smiled at the barista, who called her by name and knew her order before she placed it. That's what she loved about this small town. She sipped her cinnamon dolce latte as she walked out of the coffee shop. She took a few steps and then stopped in her tracks on the sidewalk when she looked up. Pete. She didn't know whether to laugh or cry or maybe to turn and run, so she did nothing but stand frozen in place. Hi, Pete said. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. She told her mouth to please work and finally managed to say, I'm just surprised. He grinned at her. Her heart skipped a beat at that look on his face. To be honest, I'm a little surprised too. I didn't plan to come back, but I just couldn't stay away. Oh, why not? His eyes met hers and he took a deep breath. Could we sit somewhere and talk? Um, well, she wanted to say no. Their last conversation had nearly done her in. Pete held up a hand. I mean, if you're not busy, I didn't mean to assume you had time right now. It doesn't have to be right now. We can do whatever time works for you. Mallory looked him over. His suit and overcoat looked like he had come straight from his office in New York. It wasn't cold enough here for an overcoat, but maybe he hadn't had time to notice. She thought about saying yes, another time would be better, but honestly she couldn't think of a time when she would feel ready to talk to him. Might as well get it over with. Sure, now it's fine. Do you want to go to the coffee shop? All right, he said. Mallory turned before he could get close to her and walked back in the coffee shop where she had just come from. She didn't look at him as she walked to the back corner booth and took a seat. Pete sat down opposite her. His expression was serious, and it made her heart beat faster than normal. So what brings you to town? You. The one word caused Mallory's breath to catch in her throat. You don't mean that. I do. I came here to see you. Why? Her voice was a whisper. Pete folded his hands on the table and leaned in. I can't stop thinking about you. Ever since I saw you at my grandmother's funeral, you've been on my mind. He paused and watched her expression before continuing. I know I said I'd hoped you'd forgive me one day for what I did, but I didn't let you answer, so I came here to ask if you think you could forgive me. Mallory sat back in the booth. She wanted to put as much space between them as possible. She took several breaths as she tried to put words to her thoughts. Pete, I have forgiven you. You have? His face showed his shock. Yes, I have. I've been upset and hurt for a long time, but holding on to that is only hurting me. Jesus says that we have to forgive others like he has forgiven us. So yes, she let out a big breath. I forgive you, Pete. Mallory met his eyes as she spoke and watched as he was rendered speechless. That was different. It was several moments before Pete continued. Really? Yes, really. So if that's what you came back here for, 
You're released from that burden. I've forgiven you. You don't have to worry about me anymore. Pete grimaced as he spoke. I appreciate that more than you can know. I don't deserve that. But I'm not here just to ask you to forgive me so I can move on with my life. He stared at his hands on the table and then reached one hand out to her. Mallory stared at the hand he reached out, and her heart pounded as she slowly placed only her fingertips in his hand. Tingles shot through her arm at his touch. Mallory, I made the biggest mistake of my life when I left here without you. I think I've always known that. But I really knew it the moment I laid eyes on you again. I know a lot of time has passed, but I also think we have a history that I'm not ready to give up on. Is there any way we could try again? Maybe get to know each other again and see what's there? Pete's eyes were tender and his voice was low as he spoke. Mallory felt her face go pale at his words. So many times she would have given anything for him to walk back into town and ask her that question. She had dreamed of this moment more times than she could count. She didn't trust her voice at first, so she cleared her throat a few times before she said quietly, No. No, he repeated after her and dropped his head. Pete, I do forgive you. The past is the past, but it still happened. I can't go on as if it didn't. I'm not going to put myself in that position again. I understand. He pulled his hands back to his side of the table, leaving her fingertips cold. He stood, but he didn't look up at her. Thank you for talking with me. He turned and walked out the door. Mallory sat in the booth and watched him go. She couldn't move. She almost couldn't breathe. Had she said the right thing? She felt certain she would never know. She also felt certain he walked out the door and she would never see him again. Chapter 13 Two days had passed since Pete sat with Mallory in the coffee shop. He sat in Hudson's office at camp, lamenting to his friend, I was so stupid to come here. I knew there was no way she would take me back. He stood, full of nervous energy and maybe a little anger. He turned and pointed at Hudson. You know this is your fault. My fault? Hudson raised his voice. Yes, if you hadn't told me to find out, I would have just known it was over and I wouldn't have come here and tried. So you shouldn't try something to see if it will happen, and that's my fault. No, I mean, yes. Ugh. Pete plopped into the office chair and covered his face with his hands. When he finally looked up at Hudson, he said, you gave me hope. Hudson smiled. Hope is a good thing. Usually, but not this time. It was false hope. But was it? If you hadn't come, you wouldn't know that she forgave you. Pete sighed loudly. She forgave you, which means she is ready to move on from that. But she's not ready to trust you. I think you just need to step back a little bit. You have to slow down and show her that you're not going anywhere this time. Hmm. That's what you want to show her, right? Yeah, I want her to trust me. Then you need to be trustworthy. And you'll have to stick around to show her that. Pete rubbed his chin as he considered his friend's words. When did you become such an expert on relationships anyway? Hudson laughed at that. Definitely not an expert, and I won't claim to know what all women want, but being married has given me some insight into at least one woman's point of view, and I can tell you this, they want to feel loved and taken care of. Hmm, Pete said again. So are you staying with your parents, or do you want me to set up the guest cabin for you? Hudson grinned. Pete gave him a defeated look, but didn't say anything. 
Hudson laughed again. I'll call Shannon. And Pete? Yeah, I'll be praying for you. Mallory had spent enough time worrying about what she had said to Pete. She had prayed about it and finally had peace that she had done the right thing. God called her to forgive, but he didn't say she had to let him back into her heart. She put him out of her mind, and she crossed one more item off her grocery list. She turned to push her buggy down the bread aisle and heard someone call her name. Hey, Mallory! Shannon's voice sounded cheerful. Hey, Shannon, how are you? I can't complain. How about you? I'm fine. Just getting some groceries. For one, she thought. She pasted on a smile. Me too. We needed a few things. But then I got a call from Hudson and needed to stock up the guest cabin. Oh? Yeah, his friend Pete is staying for a while. What? Mallory's mouth fell open. Oh. Shannon seemed to realize what she had said. Yes, I don't know any details, she said quickly. Hudson just said he was coming and would be here for a little while. I, um, I didn't know. I thought he went back to New York. Shannon shrugged. I guess not. Mallory didn't know what else to say. Mallory? Shannon lowered her voice. I don't know much about what happened with you two. I've caught bits and pieces, so I'm not pretending that it was nothing. But I've known Pete a few years now. He has served on the board for the Jennings Foundation, and he's been a good friend to Hudson. I've seen him be dedicated to whatever cause or purpose he took on. I will say this. I've never known him to have a girlfriend, and he never even brings a date to a function. I'm not sure if that means anything, but for what it's worth, that's the Pete that I know. Mallory looked at her with a blank stare. Thanks, Shannon. I know he's a good guy. I just also know that he wants to be in New York, and I'm not going anywhere. Shannon smiled. That's what I thought about Hudson. She patted Mallory's arm. You just never know what will happen. See you later. See ya, Mallory said, but it was barely audible. She continued down the aisle, but she couldn't focus on the items on the shelf. She kept hearing Shannon's words in her mind. That's the Pete I know. Was it possible he had changed? Five years is a long time, and people do grow up. The only thing she knew was that Pete had made sure to have no business in Pinehaven, and now he had told her he had come there to see her, and now he was staying. Pete settled into the cabin at camp. He had enjoyed seeing his parents for a couple of nights, but if he was going to stay longer, he needed his own space. Shannon had stocked the cabinets with coffee, bread, and snacks, and invited him to join them for dinner. He had thanked her and Hudson when they came to the cabin, but now he sat alone on the couch in the living room. He was just thinking that he should get out his laptop and do some work when he heard a knock at the door. Thinking it was Hudson coming to get him for dinner, he went to the door and opened it. His mouth went slack with shock when he saw Mallory standing in front of him. Hi, she said. Can I come in? Sure. He stepped back to let her in, too surprised to say anything else. He followed her to the couch, where she sat down and turned to him. I didn't know you were still in town. I've decided to stay for a while. How long is a while? Pete cleared his throat. Well, I'm not sure, really. I... I just want to be here. Why... You haven't wanted to be here in five years. I know. So what's changed? Maybe my goals for the future. Mallory eyed him for a minute without saying anything. I don't know what you're planning, so tell me. Are you staying here for me? He wanted to be honest with her. Yes. 
Mallory took in a deep breath and let it out. All right, then. That's what I needed to know. She stood up and walked to the door. Wait, Pete called out. She turned to look at him. Yes? Pete closed the distance between them. What does this mean? I'm not sure, really. She looked up at him, and he locked eyes with her. But I guess if you're here and you're making the effort to stay in town... Her voice drifted off. Yes, Pete pushed. Well, then I guess we could see each other some. Really? Mallory shrugged. Sure. Pete couldn't resist. He took her in his arms into a hug. With his arms around her waist, he waited as her arms slowly encircled his neck. He breathed her in and relished the feel of her against him once again. All too soon, he made himself let go. Thank you for giving me a chance, he said. Mallory's face looked like she was dazed from the hug. All right, she said, her voice wavering. I'll see you later. Pete watched her go, but a surge of hopefulness ran through him. He remembered when Hudson said he would pray for him, and he knew that must be part of why Mallory had shown up. Thank you, God, he whispered. And please, please, don't let me screw this up. Chapter 14 Pete didn't know when he had felt so out of his comfort zone. He had spent two days and two nights in the guest cabin at camp, and he wasn't sure what to do with himself. He was glad the camp had Wi-Fi so he could connect and get work done, and he had spent many hours on the phone or video conferencing with his team back in New York. But every moment he wondered if he could call Mallory or if it was all too soon. She had said they could see each other, but what did that mean? He stared at his computer screen, but he couldn't say what he had been reading, so he shut the screen and stood to pace the small living room. Clapping his hands together to try to dispel his nervous energy, he began to talk to himself. I could walk around town and see if she comes around. He shook his head. No, that's dumb. But I can't just show up at her house. Not that I even know where that is. Ugh. He decided he needed some fresh air. So he grabbed his jacket and walked out the front door of the cabin. Before he knew where he was headed, he found himself walking up to the barn. He opened the door and let himself in. The smell of the hay and the sounds of the horses in their stalls called to him. Walking to the stall with Gideon, he reached up and stroked the head of the large animal. At first, Gideon pulled away but a few strokes was all it took for him to start nuzzling into Pete's hand. And as Pete stood with the horse, the over and over again motion of his hand on its soft hair seemed to calm him. He took a few deep breaths. I can do this, he whispered to himself. Hey there. The voice startled him, and Pete turned to see Brandon walking towards him. Hey, Brandon. Making friends? Pete chuckled. I don't know about that. We've already had a run-in. That's right. I'm still sorry about that, but I appreciate your quick response and helping Mallory. Instincts, I guess. It's a good thing to have instincts to protect someone, Brandon said. His tone had turned serious, and Pete turned to see him looking directly at him. Pete nodded. Yes. And Mallory is someone I don't want to see get hurt. Again. I know. Me either. Then don't hurt her. Pete held his hands up. I promise I don't plan to. I don't know what's going to happen, but making sure she's happy is my top priority.
priority. Brandon backed up a step. All right, then. Pete sighed. I haven't even seen her in two days. Brandon looked Pete over for a moment. You know, there's a carnival in town this weekend. Oh? Yeah, we're planning to go. And I'm pretty sure Mallory is too. Thanks, man. Sure thing, Brandon said. I know that look when I see it. What look? Brandon laughed. The sad puppy dog look? Pete grinned. Yeah, I guess I've got that one going on right now. But if it means I get to see her, I don't mind too much. Mallory walked next to her sister, who was holding hands and chatting with her husband-to-be. They were so cute together. Mallory couldn't help but smile. She had been so glad when Brandon started dating her sister. Brandon and Mallory had known right away that they weren't right for each other. But Mallory had had a sneaking suspicion that he would like Kimberly. She sighed as she thought of the evening that lay in front of her, the third wheel to the adorable couple. She would awkwardly sit in her own seat on every ride, and she would stand to the side as Brandon and Kimberly played carnival games together. They would be kind about it, of course. They tried hard to include her, but there wasn't much that could help their odd number. Except, she thought, but pushed away the rest of the thought. What do you want to ride first? She asked. I want cotton candy, Kimberly said. I was thinking we could go to the games first. I'd like to try my hand at winning a prize. Of course you would, Kimberly rolled her eyes. You'll waste $20 buying tickets to win a dollar store stuffed animal, she laughed. Only for you, Brandon said. I'm up for some games. I bet I can beat you, Mallory challenged. You're on, Brandon said, and picked up their walking pace to hurry to the first game. Mallory was just getting ready to throw a softball at a stack of cans, carefully taking her aim when Brandon spoke. Hey there, Pete. Ha ha, very funny, Mallory said, her tone dry. Don't try to distract me. Why would that be distracting? Pete's deep voice sounded right behind her, and Mallory jumped as she tossed the ball. It went way over in the corner of the booth, nowhere near the can tower. She slowly turned to face him. Hi, she said. Hi. His eyes ran over her face, and she could feel herself blush. I didn't know you were coming. I didn't either, but I heard about the carnival and just had to see it for myself. I haven't been to a carnival since high school. Mallory couldn't help but smile at him. He looked different in his dark jeans and gray-fitted t-shirt. Different, but good. Really good. The carnival still comes every year. I'll have to make plans to be here every year. Just the smell brings back memories. Uh-huh, Mallory mumbled as she reached for another softball. She narrowed her eyes as she focused and then threw the ball with perfect accuracy. The stack of cans came tumbling down. Yes! She raised both arms with her hands and fists over her head in victory. Beat that, Brandon. But when she turned around, she found that Brandon and Kimberly had wandered off to another game. What? She said, looking around. Wait, did we just get set up? Pete smiled. I guess so. Did you have anything to do with that? No. He held his hands up. I promise I didn't. But Brandon did tell me that you would be here tonight. Oh, he did, did he? Yep. I thought he was going to be a better brother than that. She teased. Actually, I think he was. 
He gave me a rundown before he mentioned it. Mallory covered her face with her hands. Well, that's embarrassing. Nah, I have a sister too, remember? And would you let your sister go out with you? She squinted her eyes. I mean, you know, if she wasn't your sister. She paused. Yeah, sorry, that didn't make sense. Pete laughed. I know what you mean. And I would have to talk to the guy first, just like Brandon. But if I knew what I know about me, then yeah, I would. He cocked his head to the side. So are you saying you're going out with me? Um, no, I mean, I don't know. Let's just take it one step at a time, she said. My thoughts exactly, he stepped backward. So, were you hoping to play more games or planning to go on rides? Rides, for sure. Want to go together? Mallory looked up and studied his face. Surely this would be better than being the third wheel. But was she ready for that? A buffer felt like a good idea at the moment. Sure, let's grab my sister and Brandon and hang out with them. Sounds good. Pete fell in step beside her as they crossed the dirt path to the ring toss game. Are y'all ready for rides? Pete is going to join us, if that's all right. Brandon was the first to turn around. Sure, let's do it. Kimberly leaped hands with Brandon, but her face said she was more hesitant than her fiancé. All right. Where to first? She glanced at Pete with a cold stare. Scrambler, Mallory said. She had always liked the fast rides. The group nodded in agreement and walked to stand in line. So, Pete, what do you do? Brandon asked. I mean, I know kind of what you do, but what's your actual job? Nowadays, I'm the president of the company, but I started out developing apps. Well, one app, really, that made it big to start off. But now I oversee developers and acquire new apps for the company. We're more than just one app now. We own about 500 total. Wow, that's pretty cool. Thanks, I think so. I kind of miss doing the designing and coding work sometimes, though. I play around a little with it, but not as much as I would like. That's why I stay in the barn. Brandon laughed. I like horses, and I'm happy to be there every day getting my hands dirty. Pete smiled. Sounds nice. They inched forward as the line moved. What are you doing these days, Kimberly? Kimberly seemed surprised at the question. I work for the city, she said. I'm an administrative assistant in the mayor's office. That's great. I'm sure you're vital to the administration. Pete's voice sounded sincere. I know that the work admins do is very important. I know your boss appreciates you. Yeah, I guess so. Kimberly gave a small smile. How was school today, Mallory? Pete turned his attention to her. It was good, she said. We started our fall projects, and the kids are excited about that. That's nice, Pete said. Mm-hmm, Mallory said. She felt like this was the most normal, everyday conversation, but it was also one of the strangest things she had experienced. How could Pete Collins be here in line for a ride at the fall carnival with her? and asking her sister and brother-in-law about their jobs, and then asking her how her day went. Even when they were together in high school, she didn't remember him asking her about her day. He was usually busy talking about his latest business idea. At the time, she thought it was impressive. But now that she was older, she realized how much more it meant for him to be interested in her life. Mallory, Pete's voice broke into her thoughts, and she realized they had made it to the entrance of the ride. She turned to see that Brandon and Kimberly were headed to a two-person seat together, and Pete had asked her a question 
She didn't hear. Do you want to ride with me? Pete asked again. Oh, sure. Her heart began to pound inside her chest as she realized what she was agreeing to. She hadn't thought about riding with him when he asked to walk around the carnival together. Now she was about to step onto a ride where they would literally be smushed together the entire time. She didn't know if her heart could take it. Pete walked to an empty car and stepped in first. He reached his hand out to help her up. Mallory swallowed hard as she took his hand and pulled herself up to the seat. She sat down as Pete reached up to pull down the safety bar. She kept several inches between them, and a nervous laugh escaped her lips as the ride jerked and started off. She gripped the bar and hoped she could stay put. It's all right, Pete said, his gaze landing on her white knuckles. You won't fall out. I'm not afraid of falling out, she said. He grinned at her. Well, I'm not afraid of you falling into me. I am, she whispered to herself. The ride began to spin and the whole contraption went from one side to the other as it picked up speed. One fast bump caused Mallory to let out a little squeal, and Pete's laugh rumbled over the sound of the ride. She looked over at him and saw the same look on his face that he had the first day he rode in the car with her driving when she turned 16. The look made her laugh, too, and she loosened her grip on the bar. When she bumped into him as the ride slung them back to the other side, her heart skipped a beat but it was a pleasant surprise instead of a fear. When they went the other direction, he slid over to her side and squished her into the side of the cart. The warmth of his body pressed against her ignited something she didn't know was still there. She squealed and laughed, and in that moment she let go just a little bit. Maybe this could be fun, she thought, and so it was. They stepped off the ride, both laughing and a little dizzy. I'm glad I didn't eat much dinner, Pete said. I must be getting older. I never felt like I might lose my lunch on a carnival ride before. Oh, yeah, you're really ancient, Mallory said. Pete reached out and poked her in the ribs. You're only a year younger than me, she giggled. But what a difference a year makes. He reached out to poke her again, but she moved, away from his reach. Where to next, she asked. The Ferris wheel, Pete suggested. Oh, no, you know I don't like heights. So flying around and spinning fast is fine, but still afraid of heights. Mallory shrugged. At least it's close to the ground. All right, so... Pete glanced around bumper cars. Yep. She took a few jogging steps. Brandon, Kim, we're going to the bumper cars. Be right there, Kimberly said. She and Brandon were walking towards the cotton candy booth. Mallory continued towards the line with Pete right behind her. They got in the line, and Mallory turned with her back to the gate and put her hands on the rail. Having fun? Pete asked. She tilted her head as she answered, Actually, yes. You sound surprised. He raised his eyebrows at her. She turned and looked him in the face. Well, I wasn't sure what it would be like to... To what? He asked. To spend time with me? She nodded. It's been a long time. I know. But also... It's been a long time. What? She laughed at his repeated sentence. Well, on the one hand, it's been a long time since we spent time together, so maybe that makes it awkward, or maybe it brings up old memories, and you're not sure you want to go down that road again. Right? She said slowly. But on the other hand, it's been a long time, so maybe I've changed, maybe you've changed. I don't expect things to be the same as they were before. We're different, and we're older, and 
Maybe that means things can be different now. She stared at him, her mouth falling open slightly. I guess that's true. Mallory, he stepped closer to her, and she could feel the warmth from him and smell his cologne. I just want to give it a try. I'm not asking you to forget everything that happened. We have a history, but that can be a good thing if we let it. She blew out a deep breath. I think so, too. I'm trying, she said. That's all I ask. Just one step at a time, right? Mallory asked, her heart in her throat. He smiled at her. One step at a time. Chapter 15 Pete sipped his coffee and rocked back and forth in the chair on the front porch of the chapel. He hadn't expected it, but as he stared out over the camp property, he found himself marveling at the beauty and the slow pace of it all. He liked his life, and he liked working hard and being busy. But this? This was good, too. God, he whispered. I don't know what to say to you. I've never really been good at praying. But Hudson talks about you like you're his best friend and like he really knows you. I don't know anything about that, but I know that it has to be a miracle from heaven that Mallory is talking to me. And if you can do those kinds of miracles, I figure I might need to get to know you. He took a deep breath of the cool morning air and let it out. God, I don't even know what I'm doing here. I have a good life, a successful business, and a fantastic apartment in the middle of New York City. Plenty of people wish they could be me. So why do I feel like it's not enough? He sat and let that thought hang in the air for a few minutes. He wasn't expecting an answer written in the sky, but he wanted to ponder it for himself. God, I want to be a good guy. I want to be a guy good enough for her. But I need to know what that is. Good morning, Hudson called out from across the yard. You're up early. Am I? Pete squinted at him. Seems late to me. Well, you know, we move slower down here in the south. Hudson smiled. Do I ever? You know, once I was trying to acquire a company from Mississippi, and we waited three months for them to respond to our proposal. And did they sell out to you? No, Pete said, remembering the disappointment. Why not? They wanted to keep it in the family. Hudson nodded. I've run into that plenty of times in our investment business. Family is important. I know, Pete said quietly. Family matters to me, too. I know it does. You know, in a small town, it's kind of like everyone is family. Pete stared at him. Hudson, do you ever miss New York? I'm in New York at least once a month. I know. Do you ever miss being there all the time? He paused. I mean, do you ever wish you didn't leave? Hudson looked at him and seemed to understand his question. I've never regretted it. He rubbed his chin as he thought. But Pete, we're not the same, really. And I wanted out of New York before I came here. So it's not necessarily the same for you. Maybe you would be happy here in town, or maybe you would miss New York. I think really you have to decide what's the most important thing that you never want to miss for a second. Then find a way to be wherever that is. I felt at home here for the first time in my life. And I wanted to feel like that all the time. And Shannon is here. So even if I miss New York sometimes, I never want to miss Shannon. Pete sighed. I'm not sure I know what I want right now. That's all right. Hudson stepped up on the porch and patted him on the shoulder. Pray about it. Ask God what it is you're supposed to do. 
He'll show you if you really seek him. Hudson? Yeah, Pete. Do you, um, do you have a Bible I could borrow? Hudson's smile broke out across his whole face. Sure do. I'll get it for you. Thanks, Pete mumbled. He wasn't sure what he was getting himself into. That afternoon, Pete sat with his computer on the couch in the cabin. He had just gotten off the phone with his assistant, asking her to send him some vials. He had a string of text messages from one of his department heads, a dozen emails that needed his attention, and he was supposed to be on a conference call in ten minutes. Actually, he was supposed to be in a meeting in New York in ten minutes, but he was calling in. He stared at the texts on his phone and quickly typed out a response. His fingers were getting jumbled and misspelling every other word, so he switched to voice texting and finished his message before tossing his phone on the couch. Ugh. He laid back and put his hands over his face. I don't know how long I can do this, he said. He knew he needed to be in his office handling these things in person. He wasn't meant to work remotely. It had been two weeks, and he wasn't handling this well. He didn't even like to work from his apartment and was known to get up at 3 a.m. and go to the office because he had an idea he wanted to work on. Pete sat up on the couch, and next to his computer he saw the Bible Hudson had brought him. He picked it up and flipped it back and forth between his hands, but he wasn't sure what to do with it. Finally, he let it fall open, and a paper bookmark that Hudson must have put in fell out. He looked at the page, the top said Jeremiah, but he didn't know what that meant. He started reading a verse that Hudson had highlighted, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and future. Pete read the words over again. Do you mean this, God? Do you really have a plan for me? He waited, and he almost thought he heard a voice whisper, Yes. Okay, God, I'm ready to listen, and I want to find out what your purpose is for me. I miss New York. I miss my office and my business. I miss working the way I'm used to. But it will all be worth it if Mallory and I can find a way to make this work. But if it's all a waste, I don't want to stay here any longer. So will you show me what I'm supposed to do? This time he was certain he heard, Stay. He sighed. All right, I'll stay for now. But if Mallory and I are supposed to be together, will you please show her a way to come to New York with me? He didn't hear any more answers, but his phone deemed to remind him he needed to call into the meeting. I don't know what I'm doing, God. I told Mallory we would take it one step at a time, but honestly, I have no idea what the next step is. Please show me. He picked up his phone and called in. When the group was assembled, he began the meeting over the speakerphone. After making a few comments, a thought came to him. He picked up his phone and sent a text with one simple line, Mallory, Will you please have dinner with me on Friday night? Chapter 16 It was a beautiful fall evening, and Mallory was glad the rain had held off. She had curled her hair, and any moisture in the air would have turned her red locks into a ball of frizz. She had been surprised when she got a text from Pete asking her to have dinner, but she whispered a prayer as she read it and a peace came over her for this one step. Okay, God, she said, as she smoothed her hands over the dark dress she wore with denim leggings and brown boots. I don't know what I'm doing here. Years ago, I would have said we would be married by now, but then everything changed, and I would have said I would never speak to him again. 
but now we're going on a date, and it's the strangest thing. My emotions are all over the place. I go from having fun and being happy to be with him to terrible fear over what will happen and a sadness that we have all these years between us. She sighed. But God, I know you have a plan. So please just keep showing me one step at a time. She nodded at herself in the mirror as she took one last peek. A knock sounded at the door and she jumped. Here goes nothing, she said, picking up her purse and reaching for the doorknob. She opened the door, and there stood Pete, looking calm and collected. He wore dark jeans and a green striped button-up shirt, and his hair had just the right amount of tussled look to it. Hey, she said. Hey, ready to go? he asked. Yep. She pulled the door closed behind her and they walked down the sidewalk to his rental car. So, did you pack for weeks when you came to see me? He laughed. Not exactly. So how is it you have enough clothes? I haven't seen you in the same shirt twice. Huh, maybe. But you haven't seen me that many times either. I guess that's true. But if you must know, I ordered clothes... The box just arrived this afternoon. Oh, she said. She paused as he opened the passenger side door and waited for her to get in. So you just bought new clothes? Yes, Pete said, scrunching his eyebrows. Huh, that must be nice. It does have its perks. But really, I'm not much of a clothes guy. I have five of the same suit that I rotate to wear to work, then a couple of pair of jeans and shirts. I might have money, but when it comes to clothes, I'm more of a minimalist anyway. I see, Mallory said. She took a seat and looked around the car as Pete walked around the front. It wasn't a fancy sports car. It was just a plain car, but it was clean as a whistle. You didn't rent a Ferrari? She asked him when he climbed in. Nope. I just needed something to get me from point A to point B, he said. Hmm. That surprises you? He asked. Yes, it does. I figured if you could have the best money could buy, you would. Pete shrugged. It's not really about the money or the stuff to me. Sure, it's nice to be able to buy what I need or want, but I just don't want a lot of stuff. Mallory fell silent at that, and they rode quietly for a few minutes. So where are we going? She finally said. Pete looked at her and wiggled his eyebrows up and down. It's a surprise. She felt like that should concern her, but it didn't. She sat back in the seat and made herself comfortable. Do you have big plans for the weekend? Pete asked. Not really. I have some grading to do, and I need to finish my lesson plans for the rest of the semester. But that's about it. Tell me about your class. Oh, I have the best group of kids. Her face lit up as she spoke. I probably say this every year, but this class is my favorite. It's fun teaching first grade because they're still excited about learning and school is fun. Plus, they're reading now, and I get to make suggestions for books. One of my favorite things is when one of my students comes running into class on Monday to tell me about the book they read over the weekend. Pete smiled. I'm sure you have plenty of suggestions. I'm pretty sure you carried a book with you everywhere when we were teenagers. She laughed. I did that long before we were teenagers. I carried a book with me everywhere as soon as I started reading. Still do. Pete looked over at her. Did you bring a book tonight? No, she smiled. She blushed and looked a little guilty. But I thought about it. What would you have brought? The book I'm reading now. It's called Just As I Am. She paused. Do you read much? Does reading financial reports and business proposals count? He winked. No, it does not. 
you should read something just for pleasure. I find great pleasure in reading financial reports and business proposals. She laughed. I'm sure you do. But you should read fictions. Stories are good for your soul. I, uh... He paused and cleared his throat. I've actually been reading the Bible. Really? Her voice showed her surprise. Yeah, Hudson gave me one. I wasn't sure where to start, so I just started in Genesis. The beginning is a pretty good place to start. I thought so. But I also like the Gospels, the stories of Jesus on earth. John is my favorite, so if you need somewhere to go next, that would be my recommendation. Thanks, I'll try that. But you know, the Bible isn't fiction, it's all true. Jesus really came and died, and we can really have a relationship with him. That's what I'm learning. Mallory smiled at him, but then turned and looked at the road and realized where they were going. She gasped as they turned down a country road. Oh, I haven't been here in ages. They pulled into a gravel parking lot, and before Mallory opened her door, she could smell the smoke and barbecue cooking. I wasn't sure it was still here, so I drove by yesterday to make sure. We came here at least once a week in high school. They have the best coleslaw I've ever tasted. I know, I've had dreams about it. I don't know why I never come here, she said. But the truth was she did know why. It would remind her of Pete. She had avoided it all this time, and now here she was, walking up to the door with Pete right behind her. I hope it's as good as I remember. His voice was right behind her, and she could almost feel his body next to her. He reached in front of her to open the door and waited for her to walk in. I see you haven't forgotten your good southern boy manners. Oh, my mama would just die if I did. I curbed them in New York, but here I'm free to be who I am. She turned and looked at him, wondering if he meant to say that. He cocked his head as if in thought. You know, I actually think that's true. I love New York, but I do feel comfortable here too. It's a comfortable place. Mallory stepped up to the counter, ending that discussion. She didn't hesitate a second when the employee asked, What can I get you? I'll have a barbecue pork sandwich with coleslaw and french fries and a sweet tea. All righty. And for you, sir? Make it two. All righty. The girl rang up the order and told them she would bring it out to the table. Mallory went to the table and took a seat. Pete sat across from her, and when he sat down, she saw the look in his eyes. What? she said. Nothing. I'm just happy to be here with you. It feels a little bit like we time-traveled. Mallory laughed. I guess it does a little bit. But, Pete, tell me about life in New York. I don't really know anything that's happened in the last five years. I'm not even sure that it feels like five years in New York. It's gone by so fast. When I first got there, I was like a country bumpkin lost in a big city. I'm sure that's not true. You're always the most confident guy in the room. Maybe in Pinehaven, but this was different. But they wanted you to come there, right? The investor did want me to come and meet with him. But past that, I wasn't sure what I was doing. I rented the most rinky-dink apartment I've ever seen, and it was so expensive I couldn't afford cable or internet. So I would go to the public library to use my computer. I had the investment for the first app, so I was building that, but I was scared to spend too much of the money. But I just knew that if I kept at it, I could build something amazing. So when the first app took off, the money started coming in. My investor agreed to fund the production of a second app I was building, so I had a little more money. And after I launched the second app, things really got going. I had more money in a month than I could have dreamed and I had companies begging to buy the app. Did you ever think about selling it? Nope. I knew if they wanted it, I was on the right track, and I didn't want to give that up. 
So instead, I sunk everything I had into starting the business. Instead of selling my apps, I started buying others. Then I was rebuilding them and creating new apps, too. I had no idea it would explode. But that's exactly what happened. I literally feel like I woke up one morning and found I was running a billion-dollar company. It's very surreal. I'm sure it is, Mallory said. The server appeared and delivered their food. Are you ready for this? Pete held up his sandwich, and when she held up hers too, he touched them together. Cheers, he said. They both took a bite. Pete closed his eyes as he chewed. Mmm, it's even better than I remembered. I knew it would be. Pete opened his eyes and looked at her. He took a sip of sweet tea before he spoke. So what about this? He pointed back and forth between the two of them. I know it's been a long time, but do you think this could be even better than we remembered? Mallory finished her bite and stared at him thoughtfully. Honestly? Of course, I hope you'll be honest. I don't know, really. Okay, Pete said. Would I like it to work? She paused, and he looked at her eagerly, awaiting her answer. Yes, I would. Pete smiled as if she had given him hope. But you have been gone for years without a word. How can I be sure that won't happen again? And sitting here listening to you talk about New York, I know you love it. But I think maybe you were right. I have a life here, and I don't know if I want to give that up. I'm not asking you to give anything up, he sighed. All I know is that as much business success as I've had the last few years, I feel like my actual life has been on hold. I haven't thought about another girl since you, Mallory. He slowly reached out and took her hand in his. The action sent chills down her spine. I stayed away because I was afraid. But the moment I saw you, every feeling I've pushed away for five years came right back. Mallory stared at her hand in his on the table, but she didn't pull away. I've missed you, Pete, she said. I wanted to stay mad at you, really, I did. But when you first left, even though I was mad, I still hoped every day that you would just show up at my door. But you never did. I want to be mad at you now, but I can't. I loved you then, Pete. I wanted to be with you forever. She looked up at him, and when their eyes locked, she never wanted to look away. I care about you, Pete, but I'm still scared. I'm scared, too he admitted. Scared that I will screw up? But I was scared you would never want to speak to me. That worked itself out. So I'm not giving up. And I'm not running away this time. I'm not going anywhere. I want to believe you, Mallory said. Her eyes began to fill with tears, but she brushed them away. I really do, but I'm not sure we're the same people anymore. She paused and took a deep breath. And I don't think I want to be anyway. Sure, we have great memories like this place from high school, and even before high school at my parents' farm, but we can't stay there. We can't go back and relive the past. I don't want to do that. I know coming here today seems like the past, but I want to move forward to the future. I want to see if we can make a future together. Mallory's heart fluttered at his words. She smiled, but pulled her hand away from him. So where do you see us going after this delicious food? Anywhere you want, literally. We can drive down the street in my compact rental car, or we can fly around the world in my private jet. He shrugged. Really, it's up to you. Mallory's laugh rang up to the ceiling. Being with you has always been an adventure. Pete held his smile, but his tone turned serious. I've done some exciting things in my life, but being with you is the biggest adventure I want now. 
Chapter 17 Pete paced Hudson's office, even though his friend was nowhere to be found. Probably off building campfires or catching raccoons for a nature lesson, he thought sarcastically. He needed his friend to talk him off the ledge right now. He was crawling inside his skin, and he didn't know how much longer he could do it. He wanted to be here for Mallory, really he did, but he was itching to get back to New York something awful. I've got to come up with a way to convince Mallory that she could live in New York. I just need to do it slowly, and I've got to make her believe I'm not going to leave without her, he thought. I won't leave without her, he said out loud, but it might kill me to stay here. I can't work from a laptop on a couch anymore. I need my office and my assistant, and I need to be available to my company. He sighed and took a seat, but only for a moment before he stood and started pacing again. He felt like a caged animal, and he needed to get out. With no sign of Hudson, he left the office and walked. He didn't know where he was going, but he found himself headed toward the barn once again. Hey, Brandon, he said, when he walked inside the doors. Hey, Pete, how's it going? I'm all right, I guess. I just need to get out of the cabin. You want to take a ride? Could I? Pete asked. Of course, I can saddle a horse for you. I think I can handle it if that's all right. Sure. Brandon showed him the tack room and pointed out a horse. A short while later, Pete was in the saddle and headed out of the barn at a walking pace. He took a deep breath and let it out. He led the horse out of the gate and towards the riding trail. They easily fell into a rhythm, and Pete relaxed a little bit. He took slow, deep breaths and listened to the sound of birds in the trees. I don't know if I can do this, he said out loud, maybe to himself, maybe to God. He couldn't be sure. Everything I've built is in New York. Are you willing to give it up? Just the thought was unsettling to him, but he had to consider it. Am I? He wondered. What would it be like to move here, to be with Mallory? Would he sell the company? They could live on the money after all, but it was never just the money for him. I love my work, he thought. I love what I do and I love the people I work with and the environment. He sighed for the millionth time that hour. I just need to be in New York. I will just have to find a way to convince Mallory, that's all, and I can do that. He stopped talking to himself and tried to enjoy the ride. That was decided, and if there was anything he was good at, it was setting a goal and going after it with everything he had. Chapter 18 Her cell phone rang and Mallory picked it up without looking at the number on the screen. Hello, she said, trying to balance the phone on her shoulder while stirring a pot of spaghetti on the stove. Hey. Pete's voice wrapped over her like a warm blanket. Hi, she said. So much for taking it one step at a time, she thought. She knew she was falling for him. What's up? I'm just sitting around the cabin. I wondered what you were doing tonight. I would really like to see you. Oh, that's nice. But I'm actually babysitting. Babysitting? Yes, for a friend from church. She's got three kids. I'm trying to make dinner right now. Would you like some help? What? Mallory almost dropped the phone. I would still like to see you. Could I come help? I'll keep you company? Oh, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what their parents would think. Who is it? Stephen and Courtney. Well, they know me. They were at my grandmother's funeral. 
Oh, right. Mallory bit her lower lip. She was afraid her attraction to him was growing, and she didn't know how much she should be around him. Where do they live? In Saddle Ridge. So I could be there in about 20 minutes. Are you making something good for dinner, or would you like me to bring you something? Spaghetti. It sounded like a question. You're making spaghetti, or you want me to bring you spaghetti? He asked. Mallory giggled. Making. I'm happy to stop by and get something, or I could just bring dessert. Dessert sounds good. Surprise me. Will do. See you soon. Bye. Mallory let the phone drop to the counter and ran her hand over her ponytail. She glanced down at her jeans and T-shirt and wished she had worn something else. Why, she didn't know. Pete had seen her in jeans and a T-shirt thousands of times. She pulled the pot off the stove and went to the sink to drain the water. A few minutes later, she had plates on the table. Kids, come and eat your dinner, she called out. Three sets of little feet came running to the table. She smiled as the older two sisters took their seats, and little Marcus tried unsuccessfully to climb into his high chair on his own. Here, buddy, let me help you. She lifted the one-and-a-half-year-old into the seat and buckled him in. She turned to see Olivia, the six-year-old, spooning spaghetti onto Isabel, her four-year-old sister's plate. Oh, be careful, Mallory said as she watched red sauce drip on the table. Oops, sorry, the little girl said, a worried look on her face. Mallory smiled. That's all right. She grabbed a rag and wiped up the spill in no time then started spooning out the food herself. Can we watch a movie? Olivia asked. Yes, we can, but you have to eat first. Hear that, Isabel? Olivia said excitedly. Eat fast. Mallory smiled at the two of them. They did start eating fast. Mallory had just finished cutting Marcus's spaghetti for him when the doorbell rang. She stood. I'll be right back. Sit here and eat your food. Come on in. Mallory barely opened the door and turned to walk back to the kitchen. I can't leave them alone. I don't want to be cleaning spaghetti sauce off the walls. She tossed over her shoulder. She heard Pete shut the door and his footsteps behind her. Guys, this is my friend Pete. Your mom and dad know him. This is Olivia, Isabel, and Marcus. Hi, Olivia said. Hi, it's nice to meet you, Pete said. Do you want to watch a movie with us? Isabel said. Well, sure. What movie are you planning on? Frozen. Frozen? It's only the most popular kids' movie of all time, Mallory said. Never seen it. You've never seen Frozen? Olivia's eyes and mouth hung open wide. Nope, but I'll be happy for you to introduce me. Mallory laughed. I'm not sure you know what you're in for. Pete shrugged. As long as I'm with you. Mallory felt herself blush. She sat in front of Marcus. Are you eating? She asked, trying to distract herself, but then remembered she needed to eat. Oh, Pete, I forgot. Do you want some spaghetti? Sure, if there's enough. Oh, there's plenty. I'm sure I made enough for an army. Have you eaten? No, not yet. I was just getting the kids settled. I can fix a plate. Pete held up his hand. That's all right. I can handle it. All right. She turned back to the kids and just stopped Marcus from pouring milk on his tray. A few minutes later, Pete came to the table and took a seat beside her. He placed his own plate down and set a plate of spaghetti and salad in front of her. Thank you, she said, looking him in the eye. This was different. You're welcome. 
I figure it's the least I could do since you seem to have your hands full. He pointed with his head toward Marcus, and Mallory turned to see him about to drop a fistful of spaghetti on the floor. Oh, no, no. She gently put his hand back on the tray. Good catch, she said to Pete. They made it through dinner without any more incidents, but Olivia and Isabel were talking Pete's ears off throughout the meal. Mallory hid a giggle behind her fork more than once, but Pete answered every question and listened intently to their stories. All right, girls, if you're done, take your plates to the sink and wash your hands. Then we can start the movie. Yay! Both girls squealed as they jumped up from the table. Pete laughed at their antics. Sorry if they're bothering you. They're not bothering me, he said. I'm the one who volunteered to come help babysit, remember? Mallory smiled. I just wasn't sure what you expected. Well, for babysitting, I expected there to be kids. Mallory looked around. I thought you said you were bringing dessert. Pete smiled. I did. You just didn't see because you were distracted. I put it in the fridge. He wiggled his eyebrows. Her curiosity was too much for her. She went to the fridge and opened the door to reveal a chocolate-covered cheesecake. She closed the door back enough to see Pete and gave him a wide-eyed look. What? he said. We can't let the kids see that, she whispered. Why, you don't want to give them sugar? No, I don't want to share. Pete laughed, and the sound of it made her heart do a little flip-flop. She had always had a weakness for dessert, especially chocolate. And Pete Collins had known the way to her heart for years. And if the pounding of her heart was any indication, she had another weakness, and it was staring at her from across the kitchen. An hour and a half later, the credits of the movie rolled past, and Mallory told the girls to go upstairs and put on their pajamas. She scooped up Marcus, who had been dressed in his pajamas, and fallen asleep on her. I'll be back down in a few minutes, she said to Pete, who was lounging across the couch. Need me to do anything? he asked. No, it's all right. Mallory went past him and headed up the stairs. Getting the girls settled took longer than she thought, but when they had finally brushed their teeth and climbed in bed, she said good night and closed their door. She tiptoed down the stairs, expecting to see Pete still on the couch. But he wasn't there. She heard a noise in the kitchen and headed that way. Oh, she said when she walked through the door. Pete was standing at the sink, drying off the last dish from dinner. The table had been cleaned, the leftover spaghetti put away, and the counters wiped off. What in the world? I just thought I would help. You cleaned the whole kitchen? Pete shrugged. I guess I do know how, he said. Yes, but when was the last time you washed a plate? Don't you have a maid or something? She poked him in the ribs. He swatted at her with the end of the kitchen towel. Yes, I do, he said. But my mama taught me how to clean a kitchen, and she taught me how to help when someone else cooks a meal. He reached out with the towel in his hand and put hands on her waist and pulled her to him as he leaned against the kitchen counter. Well, that's nice, Mallory said, her voice cracking as her heart jumped to her throat. What can I say? I'm a nice guy. Yeah, I guess so. She looked up at him, and their eyes met. You guess? He ran a finger down her nose. You're not sure? She batted her eyelashes at him. Jury still out. What would convince you? He asked, linked his hands together behind her back. She thought about that. Finally, she shrugged. I know you're working hard on that. Yes, I am. He locked eyes with her and leaned forward until their noses were almost touching. How would you grade me so far? 
Mallory watched his eyes as they flickered from her eyes down to her lips. She could feel his heart beating against her hands that had somehow landed on his chest. She glanced at her hands, now desperate to look away from him. Um, she said, B plus? B plus? His voice was filled with disbelief and maybe a little hurt. But maybe a little chocolate would make it an A, she said. He touched his nose to hers just for a moment. Luckily, I have some of that. He released his grip, and she turned to the fridge. Can you grab some forks? They're in that drawer. She pointed with one hand while she grabbed the cheesecake with the other. So you're going to share with me? He asked. Yeah, I guess so. She gave him a teasing grin over her shoulder as she headed into the living room. She sat cross-legged on the couch and opened the lid to the dessert. Pete held out a fork as he sat down beside her. He watched and smiled as she took the first bite, obviously enjoying it. Then she held out the plate to him. Thanks, he said. They enjoyed the cake together in silence for a few minutes. Mallory? Pete was the first to speak. This was fun. It was? She asked, wide-eyed. Yeah, I like the feeling of it. What do you mean? She scrunched her eyebrows at him. This, the kids, eating together, watching a movie, being here with you, all of it. Really? Her voice was barely above a whisper, and she had stopped eating. Yes, really. He paused and put his own fork down. Mallory, I thought I knew what I wanted when I was younger, and I especially thought I knew what I wanted when I left for New York. He reached out and took her hand in his. But I want this life, family, kids, a house and a neighborhood, all of that. And I want it with you. Mallory closed her eyes and took several breaths before she spoke. Are you sure? Her voice broke. Of course I am. She sniffed as a single tear rolled down her face. Pete, I've wanted you to say that for so long. But now that you're saying it, it's hard to believe. I want those things too. Oh, so badly. She paused and brushed a tear off her cheek. And I want them with you. Then what's wrong? If we want the same thing, what's holding us back? New York. Mallory uttered the two words that halted the entire conversation. Pete rubbed his chin as he stared at the floor. Looking back at her, he said, Do you think you could ever move there? Mallory sniffed. I love it here. I love having my family close, and your family is close. My job is here, and everything I've ever known is here. I would have followed you to New York five years ago if you had asked. But you didn't ask. And now the answer is different. Pete set his jaw, and Mallory saw the frustration. She shrugged. I guess so. Back then I would have followed you anywhere, but things are different now. I I'm different now. I don't think I can drop my whole life when I don't know if you're ready to drop your life for me. Pete sighed. They both sat silent for several minutes. Headlights in the window told them their babysitting time was about to be over. Mallory, I'm not giving up, he said. Mallory gave him a weak smile. I'm just not sure there's anything to hold on to. Chapter 19 Pete stood outside the building on Main Street and carried a small box of office supplies. You all set? Andrew Hartley stepped out on the sidewalk with him. I think so. Thanks for this, Andrew. I really appreciate it. 
No problem. When you called, I knew the perfect space to rent to you. This one has been vacant for a few months. So really, you're doing me a favor. I'm glad it worked out for both of us. There's a desk in the back office that the prior tenant left. It's not much, but could work for you until you get your own furniture. Thanks, man. Pete reached out and shook hands. I'm sure I'll see you soon. Good to have you in town. Let's get lunch sometime. Sounds good. Just have your assistant call my assistant. Andrew joked. Pete chuckled, but felt sure that Andrew didn't know that Pete's assistant would arrive in a couple of days. Pete waved and carried the box inside and shut the door. He walked through the entryway to the office in the back. It wasn't much, but it would do. He pulled the desk out from where it had been pushed up against the wall. He glanced around. No chair, he said. He pulled out his phone and typed out a text to his assistant. Need a new desk chair. He sent it off and pushed the desk a little further. But when he did, the top of the desk separated and slid partially off. And a desk. He set a second text. He sighed as he sat down in the middle of the floor and opened up his laptop. I can make this work, he thought. Once the office had furniture and internet and all the office necessities then, he would be set. His assistant was flying down from New York to set up the office and help hire and train an assistant for what he was calling his satellite office. He focused on work as much as he could, sitting cross-legged on the office floor and connecting his computer to his phone's hotspot Wi-Fi. After he had sent a few emails and called one of his project managers, he stood to stretch. He went to the window and watched as a few people wandered down Main Street. He took a deep breath and then pulled out his phone again. He typed a text to Mallory. Can you meet me on Main Street when you get out of school? I don't know, came the reply. Please? He waited a few minutes before he got another text. All right, I'll be there by 3.30. He looked at his watch and saw that it was 2.55. I have time, he said to himself. He grabbed his keys and walked out the door. By 3.30, he was ready. He had a bouquet of flowers and a box of chocolates, and he knew he couldn't fail this time. He closed the blinds on the window out to Main Street and opened one part enough to peek through. He waited and watched. Finally, he saw Mallory's car pull up to the curb. She parked and got out. He saw her glance around like she wasn't sure where she should go, when he saw her pull out her phone, he walked out of his office and opened the door. She didn't see until he was walking towards her only a few steps away. Oh, hey, she said. I was just going to text you and ask you where you wanted to meet. Right here is perfect. He stepped close and pulled her in for a hug. She stiffened, and he renewed his promise to himself that he would do everything in his power not to hurt her again. Thank you for meeting me. She stepped back and sighed. I'm really not sure why, Pete. I just don't think there's much to say. Shh, let me say something. I ask you to meet me because I would really like to show you my office. She tilted her head and gave him a confused look. Your office? Yes. She glanced around, as if looking for his car. You want me to go to New York? Pete, I told you. No, he stopped her. I want to show you my new office. She raised her eyebrows in surprise. Where is that? He reached out and took her hand. Come with me. He held her hand tightly 
as he led her down the sidewalk. Then he turned her to face the door and stood behind her to put his hands on both of her shoulders. Ta-da! Mallory's mouth fell open, and she spun around to face him. Are you serious? Yep, sure am. But how? She let her words drop off. He grasped both of her shoulders again. I told you I want this. I want to make this work. And if I need to be in Pine Haven to do that, then here I am. Really? Really? Mallory turned and walked to the door. Inside the office, she turned around in a full circle as she took it in. There's, um, there's nothing here. I know, but there will be. I've had my assistant order furniture, and she'll be here to set up the office soon. He followed her gaze as she noticed the flowers and chocolate in the corner of the floor. She grinned. For me? For you? I just... Again, her voice dropped off. What? I just can't believe it. Well, believe it, it's for real. Her smile took over her face, and she went to meet him in the middle of the room. She reached out her arms, and he took her into a hug. She melted into his embrace, and Pete felt as if everything was right with the world. I think we should celebrate, he said. How do you feel about Chinese takeout? Sounds perfect. Just a short while later, Pete paid the delivery man as Mallory laid out a Chinese feast on the floor of the office. I guess we could have gone to a restaurant to eat, but I just wanted to be here in the office. No, this is perfect, Mallory assured him. I could help you, you know, set up the office, maybe decorate or pick up office supplies. Thanks, I might take you up on that. He handed her a fork. They dug in eating out of styrofoam containers. Will you have a desk out here for your assistant? Yes, I think so. Then my desk in there. But sometimes it helps me to shut the door and be alone while I work, so that'll give me a place to think. That's nice, Mallory said around a bite of chicken. She glanced up at the ceiling. You might need some lamps or something. The lighting isn't great in some of these older buildings. Pete glanced up too. The sun had gone down now, and the room was a little dark. Thanks, I'll think about that. He scooted closer to her. Do you want an egg roll? Of course. He held one out, and she reached for it with her hand. But he pulled it back. Uh-uh, it requires a tip. He turned his cheek towards her. She giggled and then planted a quick kiss on his cheek. When she leaned back, a surprised look crossed her face. She held her fingertips up to her lips. Pete cleared his throat, forgetting about the egg roll. He dropped it back on the plate and inched forward towards her. Mallory, he whispered. Yes. Her whisper was barely audible. I really want to make this work, he said. Yes, you've said that, she said. He could feel her breath against his face as he leaned closer. Pete? Mallory placed her hand on his chest and looked at him with the slightest hint of fear in her eyes. Do you trust me? he asked. She blinked and then locked eyes with him. Yes, she said. That was all he needed to hear. He closed the distance between them, and their lips met. He slipped his arms around her waist, and she shifted to put both hands on either side of his face. He kissed her slowly at first. Then the familiarity of her lips brought back the memory of every time he had kissed her before. He pulled her closer, and their lips moved together. 
He nearly groaned when he pulled back and put some space between them. Mallory's voice was breathless when she said, Wow. I guess we haven't forgotten how to do that. Not at all. But just the same, maybe we should finish eating. She giggled. Yeah, I guess I'll take that egg roll now. I guess I got my tip. Chapter 20 So then I said, Pete, you just threw your phone overboard. Hudson finished his story with a flourish, and Mallory and Shannon threw their heads back and laughed. Pete couldn't help but chuckle at his own expense. He shrugged. It was time for an upgrade anyway. Mallory leaned over and planted a kiss on his cheek. You are never a great fisherman. Come on, Mallory, you have to have more embarrassing stories about Pete from high school. Mallory smiled. Well, I might, but some of them might be embarrassing for me, too, so I think I'll just keep those to myself. She winked at Pete. The two of them were on a double date with Hudson and Shannon at their favorite Mexican restaurant. Pete reached across her for the chips and dip and touched the tip of her nose with the cheese dip as he came back over. Mallory reached up and wiped it from her nose, giving him a teasing glare. But Hudson, tell us how you and Pete met. You don't know? Hudson seemed surprised. Mallory shook her head. My father was the investor who financed Pete's first ventures. When he met Pete and agreed to take on the project, he asked me to take Pete here under my wing. Hudson reached out and patted Pete on the head. Your dad thought I might rub off on you. Pete smiled. Actually, that's probably true. Hudson hadn't wanted to take over the family business, and his father wasn't happy about that. It wasn't until Hudson's father was on his deathbed that he told Hudson he was proud of him, and he wanted him to do whatever would make him happy. My dad always thought highly of you. I'm honored, but I'm just glad he introduced us. I didn't know anyone in New York, and without you, as my best friend, I probably wouldn't have made it. That's true. Hudson drew himself up with pride. I had to tell him all the best places to eat, and I taught him how to tie a tie. Pete laughed. Well, not the tie part. You know my grandfather taught me that when I was four. But everything I know about New York, I learned from Hudson. And everything I learned about Pinehaven, I learned from Pete. Nah, that's not really true either. But Pete introduced me, so I'll always owe him. Perfect. Pete reached for another chip. You can pick up the bill. Mallory laughed at the two men, bantering back and forth. It had been a fun evening, and she was glad for the break. The school week had been busy, and she was ready for the weekend. So, Pete, are you going to join us for church Sunday? Shannon asked. Yeah, are you? Hudson joined in. He looked at Mallory. Shannon always asks Pete to go to church with us, whether he's here or we're in New York. But he always says no. Well, if you want to bet on my answer, go ahead now, Pete said. But sure, I'll go to church Sunday. Shannon's mouth fell open. Really? Sure, why not? Well, color me surprised, Shannon said. Mallory, I hope he keeps you around. You must be a good influence on him. Mallory smiled. I don't know if it's just me. I think Hudson's been a good influence, too. Yep. Hudson puffed out his chest. I'm the best friend he's got. All right, enough of that, Pete said. What do you folks do around this town for fun? You should know you grew up here, Hudson said. What are you looking to do? Go cow tipping? Or maybe you would rather go on a snipe hunt? The group laughed at the southern pranks. No, really, though. What's there to do on a Friday night? We could go to a movie, Shannon offered. Nah, there's nothing good out, Hudson said. We could go to the new ice cream place, Mallory said. 
Now that's what I'm talking about, Pete said. Nice wholesome fun for the youth of the town. He was teasing, and he winked at Mallory. Just kidding. That sounds great. I would love to share some ice cream with you. He leaned over and kissed her on the temple. That's too bad. You'll have to get your own. Mallory fired back. Pete laughed out loud. What do you say, Hudson? Y'all want to join us? My treat. Hudson looked at Shannon and back at Pete. Nah, I think we'll call it a night. You know us old folks got to be in bed watching the news by nine. He pretended to stretch and yawn. Shannon poked him in the stomach. Speak for yourself. She looked at Pete and Mallory. But really, y'all go enjoy yourselves and we'll see you at church on Sunday. She pointed at Pete. I'll be there. Don't worry about it. I'll pay the bill, Hudson said. Thanks, man. Pete slipped on his jacket and ushered Mallory out the door. He took his time and linked his fingers through hers as they walked to the car. That was fun, Mallory said. I like Shannon and Hudson. They're good people, Pete said, and you can tell they're really in love. It's nice to be around that. Love? Pete said, and his eyes locked on hers. She swallowed hard. Yes, it's nice to be around love. He turned so they faced each other and said, You know what? I love being around love, too. Mallory laughed and pushed him away from her as she went to her side of the car. She knew he was teasing her because they weren't ready to say those three words yet, were they? As he climbed in the car, she looked over at Pete, like she remembered he was cool, calm, and collected. He started the car and pulled out of the parking spot and drove down the road, even though she hadn't told him where the ice cream shop was. He probably already knew. She didn't know how he did that, but he always just knew. Maybe that was why she liked him. She hadn't been the most confident girl in her teens, but when she went somewhere with Pete, he gave her all the confidence she needed. Just being with him made her feel right and happy, and like she was exactly where she was supposed to be. What kind of ice cream are you going to get? Pete asked as he pulled into a parking spot. Do you even have to ask? No, he grinned. Chocolate. Is there any other kind? Mallory stepped from the car and walked to the front to meet him. Actually, yes. About a hundred other kinds. Vanilla, strawberry, coffee, cookie dough, rocky road, mint chocolate chip. All right, all right, I get it. There are other kinds. But why try something different when I know what I like? Pete shrugged. Because it's fun. And life is about fun? Pete slipped his hand into hers and laced their fingers together. He looked thoughtful. No, not just about fun. But I do think it's about taking chances and finding out what you really want. So maybe you know that you like chocolate ice cream. Maybe you even think you love it. But if you never try peanut butter fudge... You will never know if you really love peanut butter fudge. Mallory scrunched up her face at him. So chocolate isn't good enough if you compare it to peanut butter fudge? No, that's not what I'm saying. He stopped walking and turned, so they stood face to face. Chocolate is great. And you might go your whole life and be happy eating chocolate, and maybe that's fine. It's good. It's safe. You're happy with chocolate. But you just never know if you also like another flavor. Maybe just as much. Maybe even more. She looked deep into his eyes as she spoke quietly. Are we still talking about ice cream? No, I don't think so, he said, his tone serious. What then? She was almost afraid to ask. Pete let out a slow breath. I'm just saying. 
if you don't try new things, you never know if you like them. New experiences, maybe even new places. Maybe places like New York? She sighed and dropped her gaze. She wanted to argue, to tell him that was never going to happen, but the words fell flat. She spoke the only thought she had. I know. You do? I know that I won't know unless I try. I'm not saying I'm ready to try, but maybe we can talk about it. Pete stooped down just enough to catch her eyes again. That's all I'm asking. Just think about it. She smiled at him and tugged his hand as she began to walk. Come on, what kind of ice cream are you going to get? Peanut butter fudge, he said. Maybe I'll try some of yours. Chapter 21 So tell me everything. Lacey settled down in a first-grade desk in Mallory's classroom and propped her chin in her hand. It was Monday afternoon, and the school day had just finished. I've been waiting for details all weekend. Mallory felt a happy smile spread over her face. I just can't believe it. We spent most of the weekend together, and he came to church with me on Sunday. I mean, he came and picked me up, and we went to church and sat together and everything. Wow. Lacey's voice went into a high-pitched tone. I mean, that's great, but what made you change your mind? He just seems different, and I think he's really trying. I told you about the office in town, right? Yes. Lacey slammed her hand down on the desk. I mean, if that isn't a romantic gesture, I don't know what is. I know, right? I still can't believe he did that for me. But is he still going back to New York? Or will he stay here all the time, or, or what? Mallory furrowed her eyebrows. I don't know. We haven't really talked about it. I just feel like he's showing me he's investing here. He's not going to just disappear again. That's so great! Lacey clapped her hands together. So when are you seeing him again? Oh, I don't know. Mallory turned and walked to her desk. You know, he has work and I have work and we just have, you know, stuff to do. So tonight? Mallory turned and smiled. Yes, tonight. Just for pizza and a movie. But he said he is planning something for the weekend, and he won't tell me what it is. Lacey squealed. That is so exciting! She stood and cleared her throat and walked to Mallory's desk, where she leaned down and put both hands on the desk. But Mallory, as your friend... I feel like I just have to say, I hope you're taking things slowly and being careful. Mallory gave her friend a grateful look. She came around the desk and hugged her. Thank you. I appreciate that. I am being careful and trying to take it one step at a time. Lacey nodded. All right, good. And if he has any single friends, you know you could just casually mention my name. Mallory smiled. Of course, but I have to meet them first. Only the best for my friend. Eh, at this point I would take above average. Aw. Mallory hugged her again. Your time will come. Thanks, but don't stand here talking to me. Go hang out with your handsome billionaire high school sweetheart. At least if you do, I'll get some juicy details out of it. Mallory laughed and picked up her bag. Well, you don't have to tell me twice. I guess it's going pretty well, huh? Hudson leaned back in his desk chair as Pete took a seat across from him. Unbelievable, man. Yeah, I thought so. Well, you don't have to look so smug about it. 
Why not? If it wasn't for me, you would still be in New York and the two of you wouldn't even be talking to each other. Pete squinted his eyes at him. I guess you're right about that. Of course I am. But I still had to actually do it. And I had to be the one to set up the office here in town and convince her that I'm sticking around. You know, all the hard stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's all right. You can thank me in your wedding vows. Hudson laughed. Pete turned to look at him. Wedding vows? He said more to himself than to Hudson. Yeah, you know those things you say when you get married? Yeah, I know. It just hit me kind of hard. What? You haven't thought about getting married? Sure I have. Pete stood and paced the room. I've thought about marrying Mallory since I was in the ninth grade. So what's the problem? There's not a problem. You're right, I want to marry her. Hudson clapped his hands together. I knew it. But I can't ask her yet. It's too fast. It is? I would say it's more like too slow? Five years too slow? Yeah, but those are lost years. So we're making up ground. I need to wait. All right, then. Don't wait too long. Don't worry. I won't. Pete knew he wanted to take his time with Mallory. But that night, as he knocked on the door, he couldn't stop thinking about his conversation with Hudson. He felt sure this was what he wanted. And when Mallory opened the front door, she smiled at him and confirmed everything he was thinking. Thanks. Mallory reached out and took the pizza from Pete's hands. Here's your tip. Sorry to rush off. I'm waiting for someone important. More important than a pizza delivery guy? Mallory's eyes twinkled. You're right. Pizza is pretty important. Why don't you just come on in? Pete slipped in the door and closed it behind him. So you would take a pizza delivery over me. Mallory tapped her cheek with her index finger, as if she was thinking this over. Well, no, but since you showed up and brought pizza, I'll just say it makes you that much more attractive. What if I told you I also brought chocolate dessert pizza? I might marry you, Mallory tossed over her shoulder as she walked to the couch. Pete's eyes flew open wide, and he paused to swallow hard. What did you say? Mallory seemed to have realized what she said and didn't turn to look at him for a minute. But when she sat on the couch, she looked his way. Um, she bit her bottom lip. I said, I might say that's very you. Oh. Pete gave her a half smile. That's what I thought you said. So did you? What? Did you bring chocolate dessert pizza? That time his smile went all the way to his eyes. Of course I did. It's very me. She picked up the remote. Want to pick a movie? You pick. I'm just here for the food and the company. Mallory raised her eyebrows. But if I pick, it's going to be a chick flick. Pete shrugged. That's fine. She narrowed her eyes at him. What are you trying to butter me up for? Nothing. I just don't really care what we watch. I've got a perfect view from right here, he said, with his eyes locked on her. She looked at him for a minute before leaning over and pressing a kiss on his lips. Pete smiled. What was that for? For being such a wonderful surprise. Chapter 22 Saturday was the perfect day for an outdoor adventure. Pete asked Mallory to be ready at 8 o'clock and said he would pick her up. She was ready to go with time to spare. 
She sat outside of her front porch waiting with two hot cups of coffee when Pete pulled up. Good morning, he said, getting out of the car. Good morning. She held out a mug to him. Thanks. You ready to go? I hope so. Since I don't know where we're going, I guess I'm as ready as I can be. Pete smiled. Let's go then. It wasn't long into their drive that Pete turned down a familiar road, the one that led to Mallory's parents' horse farm. What are you doing? Mallory was surprised and a little panicked. I haven't really told my parents very much about us spending time together. She blurted the words out. I know. He smiled as he reached over and put his hand on hers. You know. Yeah. You know because you talked to them? Pete shrugged. Maybe. Oh, no. She pulled her hand away so she could put both hands over her face. Don't worry, I didn't say anything you wouldn't want me to. But I felt like I needed to be up front with them. After what I put you through, they deserve an explanation. If I'm going to spend time with you. She swallowed hard as she pulled her hands down to reveal her guilty expression. I'm sorry. I was just afraid of what they would think. It's all right. I don't blame you. But if I had a daughter and someone like me wanted a relationship with her, I would want to have a talk with him. That's actually impressive, Mallory said thoughtfully. Well, thanks, he winked at her. But anyway, we're not really going to see your parents. Oh? Nah, just going to see a man about a horse. Her mouth fell slightly open. But now they were pulling into the driveway. Pete drove past the main house and down the path to the barn. Mallory's parents still boarded houses, but now they didn't have much hands-on time with the animals. They paid a trainer and caretakers for the horses. But Mallory's own horse still lived there, too. It had been months since she had ridden him, though. She climbed out of the car and wanted to run to the barn, but Pete came alongside her and took her hand. His pace was slow and calm. When they walked into the barn, he released her hand and she hurried on to the stall where her horse was kept. Hey there, boy, she called out. The horse came to the gate and Mallory stroked his face. Hi, Mr. Darcy. I've missed you. Pete stood a few feet away watching her, and when Mallory looked at him, she saw the look on his face. He looked in awe of her. She had never known why, but it made her feel warm all over, even in the cool temperature. He walked to her and put his hand on top of hers as she petted the horse. Her skin tingled, and she turned to face him. Pete put his hand to her cheek and held her face. She reached up to hold his wrist and closed her eyes as she pressed her cheek into his palm. When she opened her eyes, his face was inches from hers. He looked like he was waiting for her to make the next move. She placed her other hand on his shoulder and leaned in until their lips met. His arms went around her waist, and he stepped backward until he leaned against the wall of the barn. He pulled her with him. She worked her fingers into his hair and kissed him, she felt like she held the whole world right in front of her. When the horse let out a loud whinny, Mallory laughed as she pulled back. Pete didn't release his grip on her. I guess he's a little jealous. Pete grinned. I would be too. He leaned down and kissed her once more. Then he put a few inches between them and said, Would you like to go for a ride with me? Yes, Mallory said, her voice sounding dreamy. Let's saddle up then. Mallory took his hand and led him down past the stalls. They entered the tack room and gathered what they needed. They took their time as they brushed down the horses and placed the saddles. 
Mallory glanced over the top of her horse and saw Pete watching her. A blush crept across her face, but it was nothing compared to the happy sigh that escaped her lips. This is what she had wanted all those years, to be here with Pete. They set out at an easy pace. Mallory wasn't in a hurry for this to be over. She glanced over to see Pete riding beside her, and she remembered all the times they had ridden together in their teens. Then everything had seemed right with the world. Now she saw a man that was different than the boy she had known then. But yet, he was still the same. Having fun yet? Pete asked. She smiled at him in answer. I thought we might ride through the trail and out to the bluff if you'd like. Sounds perfect. They fell silent as they rode, and Mallory couldn't have been more content. They rode through the woods at a comfortable pace. Pete followed behind her on the narrow stretches. When they came out of the clearing, the sun shone down, warming them after the shadows, and they stopped their horses as the ground turned to rock underneath them. Pete jumped down and tied his horse to a tree, and Mallory followed suit. Then he took her hand and led her out onto the rocky ground. They stepped carefully over the uneven stones and made it out to the edge. Mallory stayed back, but stared out over the view below. The edge of the rocks dropped off on what everyone called the bluff. Beyond that was only sky, and far beneath were trees from the ground below. Memories flooded her mind as she took in the scenery. Her friends had come here for picnics in the summer when they were kids, and late nights of hanging out when they were in high school. She and Pete had ridden out here countless times on sunny afternoons. He squeezed her hand now, and she knew he remembered it was the first place they had held hands. Gosh, it's been a long time, but it's just as beautiful as ever. Some things never change. Like the way I feel about you. She blushed as she turned to him. Is that really true? Yes. He looked thoughtful as he tilted his head. Well, no. No, she shouted, and her voice echoed off the mountain. No. He pulled her close to him and locked his hands behind her back. What I feel for you now is much more than it was when I was younger. She grinned as he kissed her nose. I wanted to ask you something. He stepped back and took her hands in his. What? Her face clouded over with panic. You know the old town ball that the town hosts every year? Relief washed over her. Of course, it's the event of the year. I used to dream about going when I was a little girl. But my parents said it was only for grown-ups. She poked out her lip and pretended to pout. Have you ever been? No. She dropped her gaze to the ground. Why not? You're a grown-up now. Yes, but once I was grown-up, I realized it was really for grown-up couples. She emphasized the last word. Oh, Pete said. I saw that the ball is coming up soon, and I wanted to ask. Will you go to the ball with me? Mallory bit her lip, trying to hide the smile that was bursting out of her. Do you really want to go? I really want to take you. Then yes, I would be happy to. Good. He kissed her quickly. Now, what if I just pull you over to the edge here? He took a few quick steps, pulling her arm. No, she squealed and tried to pull away from him, but he caught her around the waist with both arms and pulled her back into his chest. Still, she tried to wiggle away, but his arms held firm. 
He let go with one arm long enough to tickle her with the other hand. Her laugh echoed all around them, and Mallory felt the joy echoing in her heart. Chapter 23 I can't do it, Pete spoke on the phone to his project manager. I can't leave now. You're going to have to. The meeting is in the morning, and they are ready to back out on the deal. But we had everything set, Pete practically yelled. This couldn't be happening. I don't know. He just said they have some concerns, and they're rethinking it. He paused. I also think he feels like you've been unavailable, and that's why you have to come. If you're not here, I'm certain they won't sign the papers. Pete hung his head. He knew he had a decision to make. He thought for a moment and then said, All right, I'll be there. He hung up and texted his assistant, Need to fly out ASAP to New York. A moment later, the response came, I'll make the arrangements and send you an ETA. Pete grabbed his keys to head back to the cabin and pack up a few things. He would have to call Mallory from the plane. The problem was, he didn't know what he was going to say. Mallory turned this way and that as she looked at herself in the mirror. The dress was perfect, a floor-length dress that flowed and twirled when she moved. The teal green was a perfect color to set off her red hair. She almost squealed in delight. It was only the middle of the afternoon, but she couldn't resist trying on the dress just one more time. She had a few hours before Pete would be here to pick her up, so she decided to do a few things around the house. She was in the middle of putting a load of laundry in the washing machine when she heard the doorbell ring. She grinned, expecting that Pete would come in and say he just couldn't wait any longer to see her. She felt the same way. Mallory put on her biggest smile as she opened the door, but her face fell just a little when she saw Hudson standing there. Oh, hey, Hudson. Suddenly a terrible thought came to her. Is everything all right? Is something wrong with Pete? Pete's fine. Can I come in? Sure. Mallory's forehead creased with concern. She stood back to let Hudson in and shut the door behind him. He walked to the couch and took a seat, and she did the same. What's going on? Pete's fine, Hudson repeated, but he sent me here to tell you. He had to go back to New York. It was an emergency. Mallory felt the color drain from her face. An emergency? What kind of emergency? Hudson sighed, a business emergency. Now her face flashed red, and she felt the anger rise up inside her. But we had plans tonight. I know. And he wanted me to tell you he's so sorry. He had to go right away, and he said he'll call you as soon as the plane lands. He sent me because he wanted you to know how sorry he was. Mallory pasted on a smile. Thanks, Hudson. She knew it wasn't his fault. You're a good friend. She stood and walked to the door and opened it. Tell Pete I understand, and he doesn't have to call me from New York. Hudson stood too. Mallory, please, he. She held up a hand to him. Hudson, you're a good friend she repeated, but he's not your responsibility. It's all right. Thanks for coming. Hudson hung his head as he walked out the door. He turned back like he wanted to say something, but then he waved and walked away. Mallory shut the door more gently than she wanted to. She managed to calmly walk back to her room where she saw her dress laid out on the bed. She screamed as she picked it up and threw it across the room, hot 
Angry tears rolled down her face as she plopped on the bed. She buried her face in the throw pillows as she let the sobs come. I should have known. I should have expected him to pick business over me. I shouldn't have given in to his charms. Fool me once, shame on you, but fool me twice and shame on me. Shame on me. Shame on me for trusting you, Pete Collins. I won't make that mistake again. She let herself cry for several minutes before she stood up. That's enough of that. That man has had enough of my tears. She walked out of her room and into the kitchen. She wouldn't cry anymore, but she might let herself wallow just a little bit. She took a container of leftover Chinese takeout from the fridge and popped it in the microwave. She might be alone, but that meant she could do what she wanted tonight. And now that meant eating on the couch and watching whatever chick flick she picked. She might spend the rest of her life in this house alone, but one thing was for sure. She wouldn't let Pete Collins back into her life. You can't fool me three times. Chapter 24 Two days later, Pete paced his New York apartment. He had made it in time for the meeting with the other company and convinced them to sign the papers for the deal acquiring the app. That had been a success, but he felt like the rest of his life had just fallen apart. Mallory wouldn't answer his calls or texts. He had talked to Hudson, and he had told him what Mallory had said. I didn't have a choice, Pete told Hudson. Well, I understand, but she doesn't feel that way. Pete had sent flowers, chocolate, and more texts than he could count. But she had put up a wall, and he wasn't getting in. I just want to tell her I'm sorry. I know she's upset. It's going to take more than flowers or chocolate. She's not just upset about missing the ball. She feels like you betrayed her again. All right, relationship expert. How do I fix it? I really don't know. I thought you guys were on the right track. But I think you lost your trust. I'm not sure how you recover from that. Pete sighed as he fell onto the couch in his apartment. Thanks, man. I don't know what I'm going to do. But thanks for talking to me. He hung up before Hudson could respond. He laid there and thought of every possible way to fix the situation. He ran every possibility out in his mind, but none of them ended with Mallory taking him back. Suddenly he knew the only thing he could do, and it didn't have anything to do with Mallory. He felt awkward, but he got up from the couch and then knelt down beside it. God, he began, I'm sorry. I know I made a decision based on what I thought was best for me, but I didn't pray or ask you what I should do. He paused and cleared his throat. I think I've done that most of my life. I wanted to do my own thing, be my own person, get out of that small town. But I never stopped to think about what was best for everyone else. He thought about his parents, who loved him and gave him every opportunity, and how he barely even went home to see them. He thought about his grandparents, who had taught him so much and had been the reason he had so many privileges in life, and he had run from their name and their influence. And he thought about Mallory, who he left in the dust to pursue his own dreams. God, I've been selfish. I've thought about myself and only myself, and I've hurt people in the process. He sighed. I don't want to live that way. God, I know that I need you in my life. I need direction and guidance, and I need forgiveness. God, I give you my life. I want to follow you, and I want to know you like Hudson does. I want to have a relationship with Jesus. Pete stopped 
and let those words hang in the air. He felt a presence wash over him, and with it came a peace he hadn't known before. God, I want to do what you want me to do. Teach me to ask you for help and show me what you want me to do. He paused, and tears came to his eyes. God, I still want to be with Mallory, if that's what you want for me. I pray that you will make a way, and if not, I pray that you will give me peace and teach me to follow you anyway. Amen. He stayed on his knees there in his apartment, and even though he knew the world outside that door was still spinning, he felt like for just a moment it had stopped. It was just him and God in that room, and it was a feeling like he had never experienced before. Thank you, God. He rose to go and do the next thing. He wasn't sure what was coming next, but he wanted it to be whatever God wanted. But Mallory, do you love him? Lacey asked the loaded question to her friend. The two were sitting on the couch in Mallory's house. Lacey had tried calling several times before she just showed up at the door and pushed her way in. I don't want to think about that, Mallory said. I know, but I know you were falling for him, and really I know you've loved him since you were thirteen. So if you love him, don't you think you need to give him a chance to explain himself? There's nothing to explain. He left. But that doesn't mean he wasn't coming back. He just left for a meeting. But he didn't say a word to me, and he knew the ball was important to me, and he chose to leave anyway, she huffed. You know he missed my prom, right? No, Lacey said quietly. I didn't remember that. We went to his prom, but then he was too busy to come home for mine. I tried to pretend that it was all right at the time, but he chose to work on his proposal instead of taking one night to come home and take me to prom. She paused and rubbed her forehead. You know, I kind of felt like he was making up for it by taking me to the ball. You know, like it was a do-over. But he's had enough chances for a do-over, and he ruined it again. I'm sorry. Mallory shook her head. I don't want to talk about it anymore. It's over. It's done. He's gone back to New York, and I don't expect him to come back. At least not for me. She stood then. Do you want to go somewhere for lunch? I think I'm ready to get out of this house and get back to normal life. Sure, Lacey said, her voice still sounding sad. If you're sure. I'm sure, Lacey. Very sure this is what I want. Chapter 25 Pete slowly breathed in and out, and with every breath he prayed, Help me, God. Give me the words. Show me what to do. He got out of the rental car and tugged on his button-down shirt. Slowly, he walked up the sidewalk, and his heart pounded against his chest as he lifted his hand to knock on the door. He waited several moments before he heard the doorknob turn and then open. The shock was evident on Mallory's face. Then it changed to anger, and he thought she was going to slam the door in his face. Please, I just need a few minutes with you, he said. She gave a heavy sigh and finally said, All right. She let him in and waited until he sat down on the couch, and then she went to sit on the opposite end from him. Mallory, I'm sorry. What I did was inconsiderate, and I shouldn't have done it. I let you down again. I've thought a lot about it and about how I treated you five years ago, I was selfish, and I didn't think about you or give you a chance to say what you wanted. I didn't ask if you wanted to go with me or give you a choice. I would have gone anywhere with you. 
Mallory said. I know. And I'm sorry. I was so focused on my success and doing what I thought was best for me and not getting tied down to this town, but I had it all wrong. The business was never the most important thing. You were. My family was. Even this town. I know that now. I wish I could go back and change it, but I can't. What I can do is apologize for the past and move forward. He rubbed his chin and took a deep breath before continuing. Mallory, I've given my life to God. I know now that what he wants for me is much better than what I could plan for myself. I want you to know that you are a part of leading me to him. When you forgave me for how I treated you, I had never known a feeling like that. I knew that if God gave you the power to do that, he must be pretty amazing. Now I want to walk with him and follow his plan. He scooted closer to her on the couch. He desperately wanted to reach out and take her hands, but he held back. I love you. I want to be with you, and I will do whatever it takes to prove that to you. I will move to Pine Haven permanently. I might need a bigger office, but I can do it. Or I can hire someone to run the company in New York and just stay here with you. We can start something new. He reached out and gently took one hand in his. Please, Mallory, say yes. Mallory looked up and met his eyes. She just looked at him, breathing in and out, and he could almost see the wheels turning in her head. He thought he saw the faintest smile on her lips, and his heart soared with hope. Pete, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. I can't say yes. Pete's face fell, and he dropped his gaze to the floor. I'm sorry. You come in here and saying all this means so much to me. I think you're right that you made decisions without asking me, and that hurt. So thank you for realizing that. And I'm so glad that you want to walk with God. I hope that you always will. She stopped and wiped her cheek as a single tear slid down. But I can't ask you to stay here. It's not really what you want, and I'm not sure that's what God has for you. Maybe you should visit more often, but you thrive in the city and in your business. God gave you that drive and that creativity, and you should use it. She smiled genuinely at him. You would go crazy here all the time, and I won't ask you to do that. It's not right for you. She reached over and patted his hand. Go back to New York, Pete. I know you tried, and I will always treasure that. But my life is here, and yours is there, and I think we just need to let that be that. There's nothing I can do to change your mind. Pete asked. No, there's not. I will always care about you, and I hope you have an amazing life, and I'll be happy to see you when you visit. She leaned over and placed a kiss on his cheek. He stood, his pride hurt, and his face stoic. Goodbye, Mallory. No matter what, I'll always love you. Chapter 26 Mallory walked out of her classroom for the last time. The semester had gone by, some ways in a hurry, and in a lot of ways it dragged on and on. She loved her students, but some of the joy of teaching had left her. As much as she liked her job, she had come to the realization that it was all she had. She went to work every day and then went home alone to her house. She tried to stay involved at church, and she visited her parents, but it just felt like she was going through the motions. Even riding her horse only reminded her of Pete, and she couldn't bring herself to do it. 
She remembered the day he had come to her house and promised her he could stay here permanently. She had let him walk out and closed the door all the way before she leaned her head against it and whispered, I love you too, Pete. She would always love him, but she knew she had done the right thing by sending him back to New York. She didn't want to be the reason years down the road that he was miserable and hated that he had given up everything he had worked for. Mallory sighed as she climbed into her car and headed home. The radio played quietly as she drove, and she found herself humming along to a familiar song. As the words played about hope in dark times, it reminded her that there was still something to be happy about. God, she found herself praying, I feel stuck. The days are passing by, but I'm just making do as the time flies. I don't want to be like this. I don't want to be alone. I know you have never left me, but I think somewhere along the way I just stopped talking to you. Maybe it was just too hard. Maybe I'm just mad. I'm sorry for putting distance between us. Please, God, show me what you want me to do. I'll follow you. She hoped that that was true. Mallory wanted to believe that she would follow God wherever he asked her to go. But so far, he had never asked her to go anywhere very far. Pine Haven had been her home all her life. That's because I love it, she thought to herself. She pushed away the other thought, that maybe it was also because she was scared. Chapter 27 Pete sat in his office chair and fired off an email approving the final version of a new app he had designed with his own team. He smiled. It had felt good to get back to the designing and coding part of the job, and he was glad he had done it. It had meant taking a step back and delegating some of his responsibilities, but it was worth it. He liked the business side, too, but he needed to be creative. He was finding a new groove in the months since he had been back in New York. Every morning he woke up and took some time to enjoy his coffee while he read the Bible and prayed. That was different than all the years he had rushed into the office first thing. And different was good. His office door flew open and Hudson walked in. Hey, he shouted. Hey, man. Pete stood and went to hug his friend. I didn't know you were coming to town. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. Hudson took a seat while Pete went back to his desk. How long has it been? Since Christmas? Pete scratched his head. Yeah, I think so. Sorry, things have been busy around here. Same for us. We're getting ready to start summer camps, and we've done some renovations over the winter and spring. You should come out and see it sometime. I'd like that. I'm planning to visit my parents in June for a couple of weeks, so I can come out then. Sounds good. How's Shannon? Great. She's here with me on this trip. She's at a matinee performance of The Lion King. She is still a tourist in New York, you know. Hudson laughed. You're not much different now. You're an Alabama boy. I guess I am. Anyway, can you join us for dinner tonight? Pete sighed. I don't know. I've been working on a deadline for this project, and I'm worn out. I was hoping to go home and crash in front of the TV. Hudson laughed. You have changed. The Pete I know would have finished a project and started another one the same day. Pete smiled. You're right. I'm finally learning to enjoy a slower pace. You know, old age and everything. How long will you be in town? Could we do tomorrow night? Nah, we're headed back in the morning. Too much to do at camp. I gotcha. Come on, Grandpa. You can do it. Just come to dinner. Oh, all right, I'll try to hold my eyes open. You can do it. Shannon will be glad to see you. We've missed you. 
Don't get sappy on me now. I'll see you tonight. Hudson closed the door behind him, and Pete thought about his words. You've changed. Pete hoped that was true. He had come back to New York, and he didn't want to be the same person anymore. He wanted to have a life outside the office, but most days he was afraid that chance had passed him by. Pete called his assistant to say he was taking the rest of the day off. He went home and tried to relax, but he was too wound up. He decided to do a workout on his exercise bike. That burned off enough energy that he laid in front of the couch and watched a movie. He showered and dressed for dinner and was ready to go in plenty of time. He walked in the door of the restaurant and gave the hostess Hudson's name. She told him the party had already been seated and asked him to follow her. She led him into the dining room and around a corner to a more private area. Pete saw Hudson and Shannon and lifted his hand to wave when he noticed a third person at the table. His heart nearly stopped, and his feet refused to take another step. His hand flew to his chest, and he stood staring across the room at Mallory. Hudson and Shannon smiled but didn't move. Mallory stood from the table and went to him. She looked more beautiful than he remembered, if that was possible. Hi, she said, but he couldn't respond. His mouth wouldn't work. Mallory reached out to hug him. Pete finally moved his arms and clung to her as if for dear life. He closed his eyes and breathed her in. When he opened his eyes, he saw that the hostess had disappeared, and so had Hudson and Shannon. What are you doing here? Pete asked. Come sit down with me. Pete had no choice but to follow her to the table. He practically fell into the seat and turned to look at her. I wanted to see you, she said. I'm sorry. I used Hudson and Shannon to get you here. I wasn't sure if you would want to come. I would come anywhere in a second if I knew you were there. She blushed and dropped her gaze, but only for a second. She looked back up and locked eyes with him. Pete, I really meant it when I said I wanted you to come back to New York. I really believe it's where God wants you to be. Since that day, I have known it was the right decision. I never wanted to keep you from your dream. But dreams can change. Shh! Mallory held up her fingers to his lips. Let me finish. The touch of her felt like it burned his lips, and he wanted to jump into the fire. But knowing that I couldn't let you stay in Pinehaven made me realize how much I wanted you to follow your dream. And I knew that meant that I love you. And when you said you would give it all up for me, I knew you really loved me, too. I do love you. I know. But I know Pinehaven isn't for you. Not really. Not all the time. But now I also know that I want to be with you wherever that is. Really? Yes, really. Forever. Yes, forever. Pete couldn't wait another second. He reached over and pulled her into his lap. He kissed her like he would never let go, and she kissed him back. When they pulled apart, they were both breathless. Mallory, I'm so sorry. I wasted such a long time. Shh, she said again, this time pressing her lips to his. Don't worry about that anymore. We have the rest of our lives to make it up. Pete smiled. And I plan to spend the rest of our lives making you the happiest woman in the world. You already have. Epilogue Andrew Hartley took a seat in the wooden folding chair and looked over the rows of chairs in front of him to the white archway 
covered in greenery and flowers. The weather was perfect for the outdoor wedding. He had known both Mallory and Pete since high school. Back then, everyone had thought the high school sweethearts would get married right after they graduated. Andrew never would have thought it would be years later that he would be sitting here, watching the two of them walk down the aisle. He liked to think he had played a small role in getting them back together. When Pete called and asked if Andrew knew of an office for rent, he had been happy to help. It wasn't a difficult task, since his family owned many of the buildings in town, but he hadn't known he was making it possible for Pete to work from town, so he could convince Mallory he wasn't going anywhere. Andrew sighed as the music began to play, and everyone turned their attention to watch the attendants come down the grass aisle. He wished he was brave enough to make that kind of gesture to a woman. He was comfortable around people, but when it came to dating, he hadn't had much success. Maybe he was too awkward, or maybe he just hadn't met the right person yet. He couldn't say. But life in this small town was beginning to get a little lonely. He was starting to wonder if he would need to get out of Pinehaven to find true love. But he knew that would be easier said than done. His family was here. The town was their business, and getting out would mean leaving all of that behind. He put away the thought and watched as Pete walked out and confidently stood waiting for his bride. Hudson stood beside him as his best man. Andrew thought Hudson was a stand-up guy and was looking forward to their meeting next week to discuss some business ventures. The music swelled and everyone stood. Andrew turned to watch as Mallory appeared on her father's arm. She beamed with pride, and she smiled as if this was the moment she had waited for her whole life. Andrew couldn't help but smile as he looked from Mallory to Pete. That's what love was supposed to look like. That's what Andrew had always wanted, but had yet to find. Dearly beloved, the minister began, we are gathered here to unite Peter Collins and Mallory Edwards in holy matrimony. Who gives this woman to be married to this man? Her mother and I, Mallory's father said. He kissed Mallory on the cheek and handed her to Pete, who stepped forward and winked at Mallory. As they turned to face each other, Mallory handed her bouquet to her sister, who was standing beside her as her matron of honor. Her own diamond ring sparkled in the sunlight, and she flashed a smile at her new husband, who stood on Pete's side. Peter, do you take Mallory to be your lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold, to honor and to cherish, in sickness and in health, until death do you part? I do, Pete said confidently. And Mallory, do you take Peter to be your lawfully wedded husband, to have and to hold, to honor and to cherish, in sickness and health, until death do you part? I do. Mallory answered, her voice full of emotion. The bride and groom have written something they would like to read to each other. Pete took both of Mallory's hands in his and looked directly into her eyes as he spoke. Mallory, I love you. I have loved you for as long as I can remember. It was a longer road to get here than I first thought it would be. But I'm still grateful for where we've been, and I'm excited about where we're going. I know that I owe all of the glory to God. He showed me my sin, my selfishness, and he used you to show me my need for forgiveness. I pray every day that I will be more like Jesus, and I pray that I will be the husband that you need. May God draw us closer to himself closer to each other, and make us who he wants us to be for his plan. Mallory wiped at her eyes before she began. Pete, you are my favorite person in the world. You make me laugh. 
You make me feel like the most important person in the room, and you give me the confidence to be who I really am. The way you have followed Jesus has amazed me. I am so thankful that God spoke to your heart and that you answered him. I know he has wonderful things planned for us. I can't believe I am finally going to be your wife. I love you. And I will love you all of my days. I promise to support you in all your dreams and to encourage you to follow God's plan. Wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you stay, I will stay. By the grace of God, I love you. The minister pronounced them man and wife and said, You may kiss your bride. Mallory giggled, and Pete took her in his arms and kissed her. When they parted, he turned to the crowd, and with her hand in his, he raised it up in victory. Everyone laughed, and the minister said, I present to you for the first time in marriage, Mr. and Mrs. Pete Collins. The crowd cheered as an upbeat song began to play over the speakers, and Pete and Mallory danced their way down the aisle. It was hours later, after the cake had been cut, toasts had been made, and everyone had wished the couple well, that the crowd lined up together outside of the barn. They cheered as Pete and Mallory rode out of the barn together on one horse. Mallory's red hair shone in the sunlight as it hit them, and she held on tight to Pete with her arms wrapped around his waist. Pete fiddled with his brand new ring on his left hand and then waved at everyone as they rode past. Once they were past the crowd, he stopped the horse and then leaned back and turned his head to kiss Mallory once more. The crowd cheered as they rode off into their very own happily ever after. Epilogue Andrew Hartley took a seat in the wooden folding chair and looked over the rows of chairs in front of him to the white archway covered in greenery and flowers. The weather was perfect for the outdoor wedding. He had known both Mallory and Pete since high school. Back then, everyone had thought the high school sweethearts would get married right after they graduated. Andrew never would have thought it would be years later that he would be sitting here, watching the two of them walk down the aisle. He liked to think he had played a small role in getting them back together. When Pete called and asked if Andrew knew of an office for rent, he had been happy to help. It wasn't a difficult task, since his family owned many of the buildings in town, but he hadn't known he was making it possible for Pete to work from town, so he could convince Mallory he wasn't going anywhere. Andrew sighed as the music began to play, and everyone turned their attention to watch the attendants come down the grass aisle. He wished he was brave enough to make that kind of gesture to a woman. He was comfortable around people, but when it came to dating, he hadn't had much success. Maybe he was too awkward, or maybe he just hadn't met the right person yet. He couldn't say. But life in this small town was beginning to get a little lonely. He was starting to wonder if he would need to get out of Pine Haven to find true love. But he knew that would be easier said than done. His family was here. The town was their business, and getting out would mean leaving all of that behind. He put away the thought and watched as Pete walked out and confidently stood waiting for his bride. Hudson stood beside him as his best man. Andrew thought Hudson was a stand-up guy and was looking forward to their meeting next week to discuss some business ventures. The music swelled and everyone stood Andrew turned to watch as Mallory appeared on her father's arm. She beamed with pride, and she smiled as if this was the moment she had waited for her whole life. Andrew couldn't help but smile as he looked from Mallory 
to Pete. That's what love was supposed to look like. That's what Andrew had always wanted, but had yet to find. Dearly beloved, the minister began, we are gathered here to unite Peter Collins and Mallory Edwards in holy matrimony. Who gives this woman to be married to this man? Her mother and I, Mallory's father said. He kissed Mallory on the cheek and handed her to Pete, who stepped forward and winked at Mallory. As they turned to face each other, Mallory handed her bouquet to her sister, who was standing beside her as her matron of honor. Her own diamond ring sparkled in the sunlight, and she flashed a smile at her new husband, who stood on Pete's side. Peter, do you take Mallory to be your lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold, to honor and to cherish, in sickness and in health, until death do you part? I do, Pete said confidently. And Mallory, do you take Peter to be your lawfully wedded husband, to have and to hold, to honor and to cherish, in sickness and health, until death do you part? I do. Mallory answered, her voice full of emotion. The bride and groom have written something they would like to read to each other. Pete took both of Mallory's hands in his and looked directly into her eyes as he spoke. Mallory, I love you. I have loved you for as long as I can remember. It was a longer road to get here than I first thought it would be. But I'm still grateful for where we've been, and I'm excited about where we're going. I know that I owe all of the glory to God. He showed me my sin, my selfishness, and he used you to show me my need for forgiveness. I pray every day that I will be more like Jesus, and I pray that I will be the husband that you need. May God draw us closer to himself closer to each other, and make us who he wants us to be for his plan. Mallory wiped at her eyes before she began. Pete, you are my favorite person in the world. You make me laugh. You make me feel like the most important person in the room, and you give me the confidence to be who I really am. The way you have followed Jesus has amazed me. I am so thankful that God spoke to your heart and that you answered him. I know he has wonderful things planned for us. I can't believe I am finally going to be your wife. I love you. And I will love you all of my days. I promise to support you in all your dreams and to encourage you to follow God's plan. Wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you stay, I will stay. By the grace of God, I love you. The minister pronounced them man and wife and said, You may kiss your bride. Mallory giggled, and Pete took her in his arms and kissed her. When they parted, he turned to the crowd, and with her hand in his, he raised it up in victory. Everyone laughed, and the minister said, I present to you for the first time in marriage, Mr. and Mrs. Peter Collins. The crowd cheered as an upbeat song began to play over the speakers, and Pete and Mallory danced their way down the aisle. It was hours later, after the cake had been cut, toasts had been made, and everyone had wished the couple well that the crowd lined up together outside of the barn. They cheered as Pete and Mallory rode out of the barn together on one horse. Mallory's red hair shone in the sunlight as it hit them, and she held on tight to Pete with her arms wrapped around his waist. Pete fiddled with his brand new ring on his left hand and then waved at everyone as they rode past. Once they were past the crowd, he stopped the horse and then leaned back and turned his head to kiss Mallory once more. The crowd cheered as they rode off into their very own happily ever after. 
This has been Hometown Billionaire, a Christian small town romance. Sweet Home Billionaires, Book Two. Written by Hannah Jo Abbott. Narrated by Candace Peppers. Copyright 2020 by Hannah Jo Abbott. Production copyright by Hannah Jo Abbott.